morning. The first item of business this morning is consideration of business motion number 15939 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of the land reform bill. Any member who wish to speak against the motion should press the request speaker button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 15939. Formally moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 15939, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 15941, in the name of John Swinney, on the Scotland Bill UK legislation. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak button now, and I call on John Swinney to speak to and move the motion. Deputy First Minister, 13 minutes. Presiding officer, um, I can well remember returning from school on the 2nd of March 1979 to be greeted by my mother with some disappointing news. The Yes campaign had not secured enough votes in the referendum to establish a Scottish Assembly. As a 15-year-old, I had been captivated by the sense of possibility that would come from the people of Scotland being able to shape our own future. A few weeks later, I joined the Scottish National Party to play my part in securing Scottish self-government. So today for me is a very significant day. Today the Scottish Government is inviting Parliament to give its legislative consent to the Scotland Bill, the next step in extending the responsibilities of this Parliament and in Scotland's journey towards greater self-government. The aspiration for self-government is centred on ensuring that decisions about what happens in Scotland are made as close to, as possible to the people that they affect directly. Decisions that reflect the views, the issues, the priorities, the hopes, the aspirations of the people of Scotland. The vibrant debate on Scotland's future, conducted during the independence referendum campaign, is what has brought us here today. Although my aspiration for independence was not sufficiently supported by the electorate, it was crystal clear that the people of our country wanted to exercise more control over their lives here in Scotland and the political parties and the parliaments and governments of Scotland and the United Kingdom had to make that happen. As we approach the end of this parliamentary session, it is appropriate to reflect on the journey this parliament has taken, in particular the momentous events of the last five years. Since 1999, this parliament and the government have continually evolved their powers. But the pace of devolution quickened after the former First Minister published the constitutional consultation document choosing Scotland's future in August 2007 and we began the national conversation discussing the powers people in Scotland wanted this Parliament to have. In response, other parties and the United Kingdom Government established the Calman Commission publishing a Scotland Bill in 2010. This Scottish, this Scottish Parliament eventually gave its legislative consent to the last Scotland Act in May 2012. So this is the second Scotland Bill we have considered in this session. They have a remarkable regularity in coming along. And we've used the powers in the 2012 Act addressing the scourge of drink driving, taking action on air guns, reforming stamp duty with land and buildings transaction tax. However, it was clear at the time that the 2012 Act lagged behind the aspirations that the people have for this Parliament. As, we've all considered, as we all considered whether we wished to be an independent country, an offer was made to the people of Scotland that they should vote against independence uh, and they would be offered a secure, modern form of Scottish Home Rule. The UK parties made a vow promising extensive new powers for the Scottish Parliament. The outcome of the referendum led to the establishment of the Smith Commission to agree a basis for the implementation of the commitments made by the UK parties. Along with my friend and colleague Linda Fabiani, I represented the Scottish National Party on the Smith Commission and agreed the contents of its report. I pay tribute to my co-commissioners here in this Parliament, Annabelle Goldie, Ian Gray, Tavish Scott and Patrick Harvey, and elsewhere to Michael Moore, Greg McClement, Maggie Chapman and Adam Tompkins. I pay particular tribute to Lord Smith, whose patient yet firm guiding direction enabled us to reach an agreement. For me, it clearly did not go far enough, as was painfully obvious during the process. For others, it went far too far. But the Smith process has delivered an agreement for additional powers that used in the right way can benefit the people of Scotland. Extended powers over tax, new powers over welfare, 
responsibilities for the Crown Estate, the British Transport Police, tribunals, licensing of onshore oil and gas activity. But the Smith Commission only produced a report. A bill and a fiscal framework were necessary before we could implement anything. The role of the Devolution Further Powers Committee, under the distinguished leadership of Bruce Crawford, has been crucial in getting us to where we are today. Their scrutiny of both governments significantly and materially has improved the bill that we have before us today. Along with the diligent work of the Finance Committee, under the convenership of Kenneth Gibson, both committees created the tests that would be central to agreeing a fiscal framework. To me, this work highlights the excellence we have come to expect from the strong committee system of this Parliament. While the bill is not perfect, it reflects the efforts of many people in this chamber and beyond, much joint working between the UK and the Scottish governments, and ministers are prepared to recommend that Parliament consents to it completing its parliamentary passage at Westminster. The Government has already set out a number of proposals to use the powers to improve the lives of the people of Scotland. A Social Security Bill, establishing a Social Security Agency and moving as early as possible to abolish the bedroom tax. Greater support for carers, greater flexibility over universal credit payments and, as important, a Social Security system based on dignity and respect for the individuals that that agency has got to serve. Effective employability services that support people whilst coping with severe cuts in funding highlighted in the report of the Devolution Further Powers Committee. Consultation on replacing and reducing air passenger duty to boost the economy. And we have already extended the right to vote in May's elections to 16 and 17 year olds, a right they will exercise in a few short weeks uh, to the close, the close interest of all of us within this parliamentary chamber. We will set out further proposals in due course, and if we are returned as the government in May, we will fully utilise the powers available to us. Of equal importance to the bill has been the fiscal framework that accompanies it. My overriding aim has been to secure a fiscal framework for Scotland that was fair, workable and faithful to the principles that Smith set out in his report. My approach throughout the negotiations was that I would not sign up to a deal that would impose systematic cuts to Scotland's budget. This outcome has been achieved for the Scottish interest. The fiscal framework states that Barnet will continue to determine the size of the block grant and that this is the benchmark against which we must assess the operation of the principle of no detriment, which was central to the conclusions of the Smith Commission. The governments have agreed that the block grant adjustment for tax and benefits should be affected by using the comparable model and the Barnet formula respectively, whilst achieving the outcome delivered by the index per capita method for tax and benefits. Each year it will be necessary to concurrently calculate the block grant adjustment based on both the comparable and Barnet models and the IPC model. The first step will be to calculate the adjustments on the basis of the comparable and Barnet models. The second concurrent step will be to calculate the adjustments on the basis of the IPC model. Finally, if there is a difference between the Barnet comparable and IPC calculations, then there will be a reconciling adjustment to the calculations that have been made to ensure that the mechanism delivers the IPC outcome before the start of each financial year. The agreement, complex I accept, ensures that Scottish Minister's IPC model drives the outcome of the block grant adjustment process and also crucially ensures the Scottish budget does not carry any detriment whatsoever. After that, there can be no default by the UK Government to a funding model that would deliver detriment in the future. Future re arrangements have to be agreed jointly. And this is one of the key issues, one of the great benefits of the conclusion of the Smith Commission report, was that the arrangements for the fiscal framework were required by Smith to be agreed jointly by the United Kingdom Government and the Scottish Government, making us equals in determining those issues. And it is that factor that has enabled us to protect Scotland from the implications of detriment that could have arisen. This arrangement therefore fully delivers the Smith principle of no detriment and to aid transparency the results of these two models will be presented in the annual reports to each parliament. Besides the block grant adjustment, the fiscal framework sets out the agreement reached in other important areas like capital and resource borrowing, 
funding for administration and implementation costs, and the effect of policy spillovers associated with tax and welfare. And it provides a governance framework for the future, making clear that decisions in relation to the framework will be taken jointly by both governments in the Joint Exchequer Committee. Yesterday, the two governments published a technical annex to the fiscal framework, which sets out in further detail the agreement that was reached and published um, when the uh, agreement was reached with the United Kingdom Government. Uh, I would have preferred to have published that with greater time available to members to scrutinise that before the debate, but it simply amplifies and provides more detail on the agreement which the, the First Minister announced to Parliament a couple of weeks ago um, and is there for members to scrutinise as background to the process that has been agreed. We have therefore an agreement on a fiscal framework that increases the Scottish Parliament's financial responsibility, is consistent with the Smith principles of no detriment and is fair to the people of Scotland. I am therefore in a position to recommend that Parliament provides legislative consent to the Scotland Bill today. This session has seen a remarkable journey for Scotland and her Parliament. From the legislative consent motion on the 2012 Act, through the legislation for our own referendum, and then the referendum itself, the enormous engagement of members of the public on the constitutional question, followed by promises to the people of Scotland of federalism and home rule. Then the 10 weeks of the Smith Commission, a draft Scotland bill, a UK general election, then the consideration of the bill at Westminster, hours of scrutiny by the Devolution Committee and the Finance Committee, and seven months of negotiations over the fiscal framework. The result is a set of powers that do not enable us to do all that this government would want to be able to do, but a range of powers that we will use to the full in the interest of building a stronger Scottish economy, of tackling inequality and ensuring that all of our people have the opportunity to flourish in Scotland. And I believe that the more we exercise self-government here in Scotland, the more the benefits become clear to members of the public, then the stronger the argument becomes for extending our powers even further. That is Scotland's journey, and I encourage Parliament today to take a further decisive step on that journey by supporting the Government motion. I move that motion. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. I now call Ian Gray. Mr Gray, nine minutes. Thank you, President Officer. <clears throat> I rise to support the motion in Mr Swinney's name and to express my delight that we have arrived here at this debate uh, and this question. After all, like Mr Swinney, I spent 10 weeks of my life locked in the Smith Commission thrashing out an agreement on what further powers this Parliament should have. And the one major thing Smith left undone, of course, was the fiscal framework left to be negotiated between the Scottish and UK governments. Uh, and I confess that there were times when I did think that those negotiations were going to break down irrevocably and that whole, the whole agreement would fall. Uh, and that would have been a travesty because although those negotiations were in, in effect between only two parties, the SNP and the Tories, they were of course both signatories to the Smith Commission. If the Tory government had failed to reach agreement, they would have betrayed the promise made to the Scottish people at the time of the referendum. Equally, had the Scottish Government failed to reach a deal, it would have meant the grotesque outcome of a nationalist government presented with the opportunity to make this Scottish Parliament one of the most powerful devolved administrations anywhere in the world through the biggest transfer of powers to Scotland since 1999 and letting that opportunity slip through their fingers. Now, I, uh, happily for me, was not in the room, so I don't know why the agreement went to the wire. But I do know that I agreed with John Swinney's interpretation of no detriment in the Smith Agreement that it did not apply simply on the day of devolution, but over time too. And I supported Mr Swinney too in arguing that the adjusted block should not be reduced as a result of differential changes to population, uh, because he was correct in arguing that the Barnett formula, which is of course population based, already adjusts for this and so a further reduction would be superfluous. Presiding officer, I have the highest regard for Mr Swinney as a negotiator, uh, in spite of his many other flaws. Uh, and, and I want to take this chance to congratulate him once again on reaching <clears throat> a very good deal for Scotland. 
and securing the benefits of the Smith Agreement and the consequent Scotland Act. He deserves all our thanks for that. The devolution story, which brings us here this morning, has both a longer term and a more immediate narrative, and Mr Swinney made some reference to this too. From the moment this Parliament began, it was clear that it was imbalanced, that our Parliament had been created with a very high degree of legislative competence, indeed full powers of parliamentary legislation over many critical areas of the life of our nation, but it was also clear that we had little fiscal or financial power. The original variable rate was a flawed power uh, and not surprisingly never used. The Kalman powers began to address this, but it is Smith and the new Scotland Act which really writes the next chapter in the story of devolution. This is, of course, also the final chapter in a more urgent and febrile narrative born of the referendum campaign in 2014. Because Smith itself and the legislative process which has ensued deliver that vow made in the final days of that campaign that remaining in the United Kingdom would not mean the status quo but rather a new devolution settlement and substantial new powers for this parliament. And it's worth reminding ourselves what that promise was since it has been misquoted, misconstrued and simply used to mislead ever since. The promise was firstly this parliament be made permanent, secondly substantial devolution of powers over tax and welfare, and thirdly the protection of the Barnett formula. Now the first was readily agreed in the commission, although it is admitted, admittedly legislatively, legislatively awkward to do. The second is indisputably delivered with the devolution of some £20 billion worth of taxation and over £2 billion worth of welfare benefits, along with the new power to create ben our own benefits too. The third, the protection of Barnet, is delivered by the fiscal agreement and thereby we continue to benefit from the pooling and sharing of resources across the United Kingdom when it comes to the bedrock of the social solidarity which binds us together in old age, in unemployment or in starting a family. In passing, presiding officer, we shouldn't forget there are a number of other important responsibilities which devolve to us too, powers over our own democratic structure and elections, and topically complete control over unconventional gas exploitation, fracking, which allows those of us in these benches to have made clear to the Scottish public that we will ban uh, this process. But it is powers over tax and welfare which will transform and have already begun to transform this very parliament, because this day, this debate is also the latest thread in a third and deeper, longer narrative, born out of the arid years of the 80s and early 90s, when we faced a government intent on attacking, not nurturing, our crucial public services, determined to break, not work with the institutions of social solidarity, such as trade unions, a government which saw division as something strong and bracing, not something weak and destructive. Kevin Quickly. Sure. Uh, does Mr Gray not think that we've got a government like that at this moment in time that are trying to break uh, things like the trade unions and public services? And does he not think it would be better if we had even more powers to deal with these things rather than rely on the Tories at Westminster to deal with them? Do indeed, Gray. I do indeed think that we have a government like that at the moment, and I'll come to what I think about that uh, immediately. Because out of the 80s and 90s came the idea that we could have a devolved democratic institution which would allow us to stand strong and make our own decisions about the kind of Scotland we want. And that saw this place conceived, campaigned for and then created. And I think we do have a UK government now hell-bent on wrong-headed austerity, cutting futures rather than investing. And this parliament was made for a time like this. And these new powers which will flow from the LCM and the legislation that follows ensure we can choose a different way. Look at yesterday's statistics on inequality and poor health in teenagers. They need us to choose a different way. Or think of our children in care today, still with more chance of finding their way to prison than to university. Or our fellow citizens living with disability, seeing their support cut and cut again. It is the choice to do better for them which is coming our way. Presiding officer, a legislative consent motion 
on a wet Wednesday morning. You could not get more mundane than that. And yet any of us who is not excited by the opportunity this moment presents to us has to ask themselves if they are in the right place. Anyone, anyone, Mr Stewart, who sees these powers over tax and welfare and only asks themselves, why don't I have more, rather than what am I going to do with this incredible opportunity, should be asking themselves if they are in the right place. And the truth is this. We do not leave this parliament after this parliamentary session as we found it. However bumpy the ride, we have transformed it. But if that was the achievement of the parliament session now ending, and Mr Swinney elaborated how much of our time and attention it has dominated in the past five years, if that is the achievement of the session now ending, surely now the obligation is on us to use it to transform our nation and the lives of its people. The Parliament, this Parliament is indisputably big enough now to do that. The question is, are we big enough to make it happen? There is no excuse for timidity now. No excuse to accept cuts that we say are unacceptable. No excuse to fail in making the investments we say are critical. No reason to say that there is another way and then fail to take it. The hard negotiations to empower this parliament are done and now we must make the hard choices to use its powers to stop the cuts, to protect our people and to make their future what we know it can be. Thank you, Mr Gray. I now call on Annabel Goldie. Ms Goldie, six minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I understand this is not my final speech. That will take place next week. But in a sense, this bill encapsulates a journey for me. A marked change in my own views since 1999, and it reflects a significant development in the life of this institution. So, in a way, it brings me to a natural conclusion of a process in which I've been closely involved at the very point when I also reached the conclusion of my time here, perhaps an appropriate symmetry. It is also, I imagine, the last time that I shall face the Cabinet Secretary, uh, the Deputy First Minister, in this chamber. So, before proceeding to the meat of this debate, I would ask the Chamber to indulge me in some very brief reflections. What we are discussing this morning is a culmination of a process which began when there was a recognition that the Scotland Act of 1998 was not the end of the story, but the opening chapter to a longer one. I realised after some years that the limitations of that Act were putting a break on the natural desire of this Parliament to take on more responsibility, and at the same time putting a corset on real political responsibility. And in, 19, in 2007, I was one of the progenitors of the Calming Commission, which took us as the Deputy First Minister said to the Scotland Act of 2012. And in September 2014, the Smith Commission was announced by the Prime Minister and I was delighted to be asked to serve on that. And that process culminated in the Scotland Bill, the legislative consent motion for which we debate today. I've also with pride played my part in another place, supporting this bill and ensuring that the parliamentary and political significance of the bill is understood. But the genesis of this bill was the Smith Commission, and I want to acknowledge the Herculean task undertaken by a man of immense talent, Lord Smith. His wise and patient stewardship of the process ensured a positive outcome. And I also pay tribute to the other members of the Commission. But particularly, I'd wish to comment, perhaps in the role of the Cabinet Secretary, my friend John Swinney, also a member of the Commission, a task for him which I recognised was never going to be easy. He and I have been members of this Parliament since 1999. We have our different political <clears throat> objectives. We have a robust divergence of views on a range of issues. But he skillfully prosecutes his case with focus, intelligence, integrity and courtesy. And it's been my privilege to see that at first hand, whether in his convenership of the Enterprise Committee or in budget negotiations between our two parties in the period of minority government, or in the Smith Commission, or in the challenging discussions to reach agreement in the fiscal framework, or in this chamber. And he has earned respect as a public figure, and it has been a pleasure to work with him as a political opponent. 
I shall particularly miss his hugely entertaining outbursts of faux indignation. <laughs> Presiding officer, between the <coughs> Smith Agreement and today, much has happened. On the bill, the UK government listened to opposition parties and others, including the Scottish Government, bringing forward a raft of amendments at report stage and throughout the proceedings in the House of Lords, which devolved abortion law, clarified powers over welfare, and put beyond any doubt that there were no vetoes contained in the bill. The bill implements the Smith Commission in line with my party's previous pledges. No one can dispute the muscle and clout now coming to the Scottish Parliament. Lord Smith said on the 24th of February, and I quote, when the Smith Agreement was passed to the Prime Minister and the First Minister, both gave their word that they would deliver it into law. They have met that promise in full. Presiding officer, this is a big day for the Scottish Parliament, not because I am about to leave it, nor because I have just said some nice things about Mr Swinney, but because this is the day the Scottish Parliament prepares to graduate. Today, this Parliament gives a green light to the Scotland Bill. And that bill will create a powerhouse Parliament. Independent research by SPICE has shown that the Scottish Parliament will become one of the uh, most powerful devolved legislators in the world with a higher degree of autonomy than many federal states like the states of the US, Germany, Australia. But this is also the day, as Ian Gray was saying, when the public debate about our country's future moves from questions of constitutional process and grievance politics and onto the real business of using power to improve people's lives. With control over around £12 billion of income tax revenues and around £5 billion of assigned VAT, plus responsibility over welfare benefits worth approximately, according to recent figures, £2.7 billion, real politics is arriving. And the Cabinet Secretary's job just got harder. Let me console him. It could be worse. He has been spared being the Chancellor of an independent Scotland, facing in year one a £15 billion deficit, turbulent oil markets, and using, and using someone else's currency. Presiding officer, it is healthy that for the first time in 17 years we have discussed setting a Scottish rate of income tax in this Parliament, and we have begun to tentatively debate the design of employment services and welfare. That potty is a big challenge for the Scottish Government in designing a social security system which is fair but also incentivises work and constructing a tax regime which does not place Scotland at a disadvantage with the rest of the United Kingdom. Presiding officer, I and my party wanted to see a Scottish Parliament emerge from this process which is more politically and financially responsible and accountable. And I also wanted to see reflected the overwhelming desire of the majority of people in Scotland for a stronger Scottish Parliament within the United Kingdom. On all of that, the Scotland Bill delivers. As to how all of that plays out is for our successors as members of this Parliament. And I pray that they may, ble may be blessed with wisdom. Uh, Presiding officer, my party supports the motion in Mr Swinney's name. Yeah. Thank you, Ms Goldie. I now call on Bruce Crawford to speak on behalf of the Devolution Further Powers Committee. Six minutes, Mr Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted today to speak as the convener of the Devolution Further Powers Committee. I want to thank all of the members of the Devolution Committee, past and present, for the manner in which they approached their tasks. I will pay a special mention to Duncan McNeill. I will remember fondly when a, a witness was being evasive when Duncan would roll his sleeves up in that shipyard fashion and make sure they answered the questions that we wanted answered. So we thank you for that, Duncan. I also want to thank all our parliamentary committees that have contributed to our report. Uh, also, our two advisors to the committee, Christine O'Neill and Professor Nicola McEwen. But lastly, particular tribute to Stephen Him Imray, Stephen Herbert and Andrew Howlett. They did a remarkable job as clerks to the committee. The process around the development and negotiation proposals for further devolution has at times been pressurised. Uh, the, the, the process was also frequently taken place behind closed doors in a private space where two governments could negotiate. As a parliamentary committee, we felt strongly that we had a responsibility to try and open up the process in order to place transparency, accountability and parliamentary scrutiny at the heart of our work. In that light, I am grateful to all the individuals, experts, organisations and particularly civic society who engaged so fully with our work, particularly in regard to the proposed welfare powers. As a committee, we set ourselves two straightforward litmus tests to be passed before we considered the committee would be able to recommend legislative consent to the Parliament. 
Firstly, the Scotland Bill provision should meet both the spirit and substance of the Smith's Commission recommendations. Secondly, that any fiscal framework agreed between the two governments must be seen to be fair and sustainable. That is, the Scottish budget should experience no detriment. We consider both tests were equally valid uh, and, and of the same value. President Officer, I want to keep my remarks on the Scotland Bill itself brief. I do ever want to welcome the changes the UK Government made to the Bill and the role played by the Secretary of State, David Mundell, uh, many of which will reflect the recommendations that the Committee had in its interim report. And just a couple of examples. Firstly, provisions that the Scottish Parliament cannot be abolished without a referendum of the Scottish people. After all, the people of Scotland are sovereign. Secondly, a clear articulation of the new powers that is closer to the spirit and substance of Smith in relation to the new and top-up benefits, carer's allowance and the ability to introduce gender quotas. However, the committee continues to have some concerns regarding the content of the Scotland Bill. For instance, on employment support, it remains the case that only the programmes relating to individuals who have been unemployed for more than a year will be devolved. Nevertheless, President Officer, I can say that on balance we consider the Scotland Bill meets our first test for legislative consent to be agreed. President Officer, the fiscal framework became the key issue in our scrutiny of the proposals for further devolution. Ultimately, it was also the critical element in the whole process as far as both governments were concerned. I too congratulate the Deputy First Minister for his negotiating skills. And in doing so, I was reminded of President Kennedy's words when he said, let us never negotiate out of fear, let us let it never fear to negotiate. However, it would be wrong not to recognise that the delay in agreeing a fiscal framework had a negative impact on the scrutiny we were able to undertake on this crucial agreement. President Officer, I mentioned earlier that there should be no detriment to the Scottish budget was a key issue for the committee. We therefore welcome the, the, the agreement that has been reached on block grant adjustment and indexation for the transitional period to 21-22. We do however have some remaining concerns and I think these concerns are shared by the Finance Committee. It's clear that the two governments and the evidence to us appeared to have different interpretations of what will happen if no agreement can be reached following the review of the transitional period. To be fair, the Deputy First Minister was clear about what he thinks will happen, the Chief Secretary far less so. I would say to the Chief Secretary in the words of another American President, Abraham Lincoln, you cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. <laughs> Nevertheless, we welcome the fact that there will be an independent review of the operation of the fiscal framework, which will report by the end of 2021. It's also right to recognise that despite the agreement, that has been reached, there remains significant amount of detail to be agreed. All of these arrangements must be subject to parliamentary scrutiny in the next session of Parliament. President Officer, despite the lack of detail in some areas and the undeniable challenges that lie ahead, the committee was on balance prepared to endorse the fiscal framework. Accordingly, we consider that both the tests that we set ourselves at the outset of our work have on balance been met and we recommended that the Scottish Parliament gives its consent to the Scotland Bill. President Officer, it has been my privilege to be the convener of the Devolution Further Powers Committee. It is now time to pass the baton of responsibility on to the next Parliament. They will have a big job ahead of them, scrutinising any new legislation that will flow from this Bill. And to do that job justice, it will be vital that the structures and operations of the committees in the next Parliament are made fit for purpose to deliver the changes that the people of Scotland will rightly expect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Crawford. We now move to the open debate. Linda Fabiani, followed by Duncan McNeill. <laughs> Sorry, President Officer, you caught me unawares there. <laughs> uh, I'm really pleased uh, to have reached this point, which, of course, is outlined by the Deputy First Minister has come from Calman, Scotland Act 2012, and the promises made to Scotland just before the independence referendum, federalism and home rule. Ian Gray uh, talks of rhetoric around this question being misleading. Uh, my contention would be that in the days running up to our independence referendum, it was those who live in Scotland who were in fact misled. 
Indeed, <clears throat> with the understandable dissent of Alex Johnson, MSP, the Devolution and Additional Powers Committee concluded that, in paragraph 710, there are still some areas where we feel that the Scotland Bill continues to fall short of the spirit and substance of Smith, notably in relation to the devolution of employment programmes. And that is as Mr Crawford outlined. Yes, certainly. Alex Jones. I, I hear the comments that Linda Fabiani makes, but how does this equate to the remark made by Lord Smith himself that he believed that the vow and the promises of the Commission had been fulfilled? Linda Fabiani. Well, you know, Lord Smith can answer for himself. What I can talk about is what we came to an agreement on in the committee, with the exception of yourself. And the fact is that what was agreed in Smith and outlined in the agreement has been changed and mm -hmm. slashed in terms of funding coming in relation to the work programmes. That cannot be denied. Uh, let's look further at this. Uh, committee members, SNP, Labour, Lib Dem and Green concluded that the committee is disappointed with the decisions that have been taken in the area of employment programmes, both in terms of the degree of devolution and now on the stark reductions in the actual budgets that will be devolved. As I said, a complete change from what was in the Smith Agreement. The committee also said that these decisions will seriously undermine a, Scottish, a future Scottish Parliament's ability to make a meaningful change to some people's lives through tackling unemployment. So, let's not pretend that this Parliament is today considering a package of additional powers which will allow this or any future Scottish Government to truly transform lives. We have to be realistic about this. During the Smith Commission sittings, there were overriding themes. The potential use of additional powers, the principle of no detriment, no thank you, that both governments should enter into further negotiations with parity of esteem as equal partners. Well, as far as the no detriment is concerned, despite the initial attempts of the Treasury to use the negotiations in the fiscal framework to cut Scotland's budget to the tune of £7 billion, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister negotiated a deal to deliver powers promised to Scotland, some of these powers without allowing a single penny to be removed from the Scottish budget. And I think that is something that we should thank them both for very much indeed. As far as the parity of esteem and um, coming together as equal partners is concerned, we discussed this at committee. Um, it was difficult to get a very definitive answer uh, from the Treasury Minister, but I think this Parliament should certainly, <coughs> two a one, be behind anyone who in the future goes to negotiate for Scotland and should insist that that parity of esteem and equal partnership is maintained. The other uh, overriding theme I mentioned was what we do with any additional powers uh, that come our way. And I'm really pleased um, that the SNP government has already set out plans to use the new powers to be delivered. Already there has been statements about increasing carers allowance to the same level as job seekers allowance. Abolishing the bedroom tax, actually having the power to do that. And that, that is something that's very, very important. We have spent an awful long time mitigating the effects of what has been coming from Westminster to Scotland. And whilst this is not the full package of powers that we would want to truly transform lives, as I said earlier, there are things we can do with our own powers instead of always chasing behind, trying to make up for the shortfalls of a, a Westminster government that, let's face it, uh, was not voted into power by Scotland. There's other things we can do, practicalities. Um, allowing benefit claimants to be paid fortnightly rather than monthly. Something that's very important to families who have disabled children, scrapping that 84-day rule which removes income. And as John Swinney said earlier, bringing forward a social security bill which creates a system that has dignity at its heart. So very, very important. And despite that huge cut um, in the work programme, we will do what we can using these powers to support people back into employment. There's many other things that I've already stated we will do, many other things we can do. Uh, one of my hopes is that in that parity of esteem and equal partnership 
with the Westminster government and the Scottish government. There will be times when we look at things and say, right, it would be much more sensible to make adjustment here in relation to powers. The committee mentioned that about gift aid uh, because there is an anomaly there. I'm sure there'll be many other things that we can discuss that will allow both sides to have that respect, both sides to be equal partners and actually working for the best of everyone who lives in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. Can I now call Duncan McNeill? This is Mr McNeill's final speech in the Parliament. Thank you, President Officer. And can, I, can I take just a moment to, to thank all those uh, uh, members of staff who served me my breakfast and put up with my rants about the IT system and supported me in the, 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 the committees uh, uh, of, of the Parliament, right down uh, to Paul Grice, uh, whose advice uh, um, uh, and support that, that I valued very much over that pace. And I should mention um, Alison McKenzie, um, who uh, my PA, my constituency office, font of all knowledge, uh, and all of those who have worked for me over that period of time, Colin, uh, Jill, Craig, uh, and Richard. Presiding officer, one of my first speeches um, as a newly elected MSP, one of your predecessors indulged me by allowing the opportunity to announce the birth of Chloe, the second of my four grandchildren. In a few weeks' time, like this parliament, Chloe will turn 17. One of the first of the devolution generation, who have grown up every day with a Scottish Parliament as part of their lives. So, as a tiny baby as she was then, she has become a beautiful young adult, and in many, in, in many ways, the formative years of this Parliament have mirrored, mirrored that familiar journey from infancy to maturity. We certainly had our teething problems, our sleepless nights, when we tackled very early on the the discrimination and inequality that, that, uh, uh, that, that, that was within Scottish society then and what ground we've made up. And of course, the cost of this beautiful building. And at some times we felt almost under siege uh, 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 at that time. Of through time we have found a place in Scottish life, we have found a confidence, but without the ability, the ability seriously to as, uh, uh, tackle that unbalance, as which was referred to Ian Gray, raise our own money. Many of the debates were dismissed, uh, lacking political maturity, and it's worse resembling that sloppy teenager complaining about not getting enough pocket money. These tensions became so heated that we even threatened to leave altogether. Instead, we have agreed on a new settlement, which we should at least take satisfaction at the end of this day we will all come together and agree, as the Deputy First Minister said, this is a significant day for us all. We are now a 17-year-old parliament about to come of age, ready to take on more responsibilities and then earn more of our keep, excited and enthused, as others have mentioned, about the opportunities that will, be, that will provide. Of course, there will be challenges there as well. It will change politics and it will change how we do our politics. But we have been given our key to the income tax door. But as someone who has served in Holly, Hollywood, Holly, Hollywood, <laughs> that, was my Holly, that was my senior moment. <laughs> Sometimes, some, sometimes, uh, uh, Hollywood techniques. But I've said, I've said in this parliament, uh, uh, as a party whip, as a corporate body member, a committee convener, uh, and, and, and a proud uh, chair of the Labour Party group, as someone who, who argued strongly for these powers to come to Scotland, even when it wasn't as popular within my own party, I, I believe that I'm qualified, entitled to question whether we have demonstrated sufficient responsibility to exercise them. And in my experience, it tells me that this parliament has not kept pace with that change, and it must do so soon 
if its work is to, uh, to be effective for the people it serves. I was reminded this week that Robin Cook came to, to this parliament when, when, when he was uh, the, the, the House leader. Uh, this parliament was new and, uh, and uh, there were things here to be learned uh, in, in his journey to reform Westminster. It's a, you know, it saddens me to say that we now have to do a bit of learning from them and how they run their business. Um, it will be, of course, for the, the next Scottish Government to decide how their policies and how the new powers can be used to implement those policies and how we should tackle the big issues that we've been discussing here, uh, how we build a successful economy, how we transfer uh, and transform uh, the, the, the health service to make it even better than it is. Um, and th that, that, that biggest challenge of all those inequalities that affect and exclude so many of our population. But it will be, it'll be this Parliament's responsibility to ensure that there, there is accountability, there is scrutiny and even opposition when that is necessary. We must ensure that we're capable of meeting that challenge or we'll face the consequences. The role of presiding officer will be key in that. And one, uh, I, I, I pay tribute to Tisha Margaret, Marwick for the job she has done in, 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 uh, as an advocate of change and reform for our parliament. And I know that she has said herself that she has not been able to win all of the arguments. How can we ensure that our predecessor can take on this mantle and ensure that our procedures, structures, ways of working are fitting for a modern, powerful parliament. I, I, I believe that we need to ditch the convention. I believe that in the way we elect a new presiding officer is integral to changing Holyrood. Holyrood. Why not have open election where all members are free to put themselves forward? not just those favoured by the leadership or the party whips, and be allowed to stand in their own manifesto of reform, gaining a mandate which cannot be restrained by those who oppose change. Those ideas could be put forward in hustings, engaging with people beyond this parliament on their expectation for this parliament and cross-party support should be necessary, if not compulsory. Equally, the status and independence of our committees, conveners, needs to be elevated and protected so that finally our ambitions for our committees are, re are realised. We all wanted our parliament to be different from Westminster, better, and in many ways we have succeeded. But we must be open enough to recognise that in some ways it is not worked, where the systems are better and the power and functions of a committee is one area where we need to get right. We must also ensure that our parliamentarians, our opposition parties, have resources and means to do just that. A strong opposition is vital to our democracy, and we need to ensure they are equipped to do this effectively. Alas, this will be a debate that will be taken forward by members of the next Scottish Parliament, of which I will not be one. This is my last contribution, has been said, after 17 years. On my first day as an MSP for Green Limber Clyde, the first elected representative to be born and bred in the area, I stood just a few feet away from Donald Dewar when he made his famous speech to open the Parliament. He said, in the quiet moments today, we might hear some echoes from the past. The shout of the welder and the din of the great Clyde shipyards. I was a cocker burner not a welder, but I hope I have provided more than just an echo of Scotland's industrial past. I have always tried to be an authentic voice for working people in my community and the families that live there, and many communities like it. When I entered the gates of that shipyard under Lower Clyde at the tender age of 15, even younger than Chloe, I thought I had a job for life. I could never have imagined that 50 years later, I would represent my colleagues, my family, neighbours in the Scottish Parliament, and what an honour that has been. We have seen what bad governments can do, 
when livelihoods of thousands of men and women were taken from them. A community that was plunged into mass unemployment and all the associated problems they're still living with. And I have seen what good governments can do with the regeneration of that community, attracting jobs, building new homes and schools and allowing people to live healthier lives. Good government comes when they're forced to test their ideas, build consensus and correct mistakes. Chloe and her generation will look to the Scottish Parliament for good government, which protects people when they're vulnerable and provides them with opportunity when they're ready to take it. I know there is good people in this Parliament. There can be good government. And I will watch you from afar and wish you well for, for your future and the future of the Scottish people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr McNeill. On behalf of the Parliament, can I thank you for your contribution as a member, SPCB member, committee convener and as a great parliamentarian. You have served this Parliament well and it has been a privilege to have been on the journey with you. We wish you well in all you do in the future. Thank you. Tavis Scott, six minutes, Mr Scott. Officer, I too found a Duncan McNeill speech uh, last night when I was uh, waiting for uh, looking forward to this uh, debate because I had some inkling that Duncan would be, uh, uh, would be uh, giving some thoughts on his uh, uh, very distinguished time in this uh, place. It was actually when um, he was congratulating a good friend of his on becoming the Deputy Minister for Sport and Culture in uh, November 2000. And it's, it, I suppose it's, uh, Duncan will remember well, it's uh, some relation to uh, Labour's then consideration of where sport and culture policy should be. And he uttered the uh, somewhat uh, pointed phrase, I wish him, this is the new minister, every success, and look forward to hearing less about Puccini and more about Purini. Um, Duncan will remember Purini was a rather indifferent left back at Ibrox in those days. Uh, and Puccini, I think, is rather well known for other reasons. But uh, uh, Duncan always brought those... Uh, uh, those thoughts to this place and if I may say so um, he also saved me on one occasion when he was chairman of the uh, Labour Parliamentary Party uh, uh, I forget now what the issue was and frankly I probably choose to forget what the issue was but there was some carry on in transport as there ine inevitably was uh, and I had to go along to the Labour group to explain whatever uh, Jackie Bailey's laughing so it clearly must have been something in her area uh, it, it, it explained some difficulty that had been uh, that had happened and Duncan said don't worry they won't all eat you before breakfast but probably just later and that uh, I was grateful to him for uh, getting me through that particular um, that particular meeting I also wanted to reflect uh, if I may, on the uh, two, uh, as uh, the Deputy First Minister did, on what's got us here in the first place. Uh, I recall a uh, Croft uh, discussion in the 99 election when uh, someone who's in the middle of uh, his lambing um, and therefore wasn't particularly keen to talk to any politician um, were, said to me over, the, over a gate out in the west of Shetland, um, until you lot have some responsibility for both sides of the Croft account, as he put it, he meant obviously the, the nation's balance sheets, uh, then uh, your place will not grow up. And I think today uh, much of that in the way in which the Deputy First Minister expressed it and uh, Ian Gray and Annabel Goldie uh, is, is so. Uh, it is that uh, we would take decisions on both sides of that um, of that balance sheet that we would be able to ensure our decisions whether to invest in schools or to cut education, whether to create a fair social security system for those less fortunate in our country as, as us, uh, or indeed to really debate the divisions over tax uh, and spend affecting every citizen and every business uh, as they uh, should be. And that is, uh, I think, profoundly important for the future of this institution uh, in its relevance to uh, people, but also in terms of its, um, its uh, real importance. Uh, others have mentioned the Smith Commission, the uh, basis for what is being discussed uh, here today, this uh, legislative consent uh, motion. I just want to share and concur with the thoughts expressed around uh, both Lord Smith, uh, also my own uh, colleague uh, Mike Moore, and all those who served uh, on that body and the support for it, because there was some very able support across um, the civil servants of both uh, London and, if I may say so, Edinburgh uh, as well. And I also want to uh, pay tribute to John Swinney, uh, not just for his role in that, but I also want to 
agree with Annabel Goldie's assessment and Ian Gray's assessment uh, of what has happened with, uh, on the Fiscal Commission uh, and genuinely thank John uh, Swinney for uh, that uh, work, which is profoundly important um, for now, but also, in my view, for the longer term uh, as well. Um, the Deputy First Minister made an observation that, it, the, that Smith, the Smith and Commission's recommendations didn't go far enough um, uh, for some and were too far for others. And in that, of course, uh, that is true. They don't go far enough for me either in some areas because uh, I profoundly believe in the devolution, not just of power within uh, uh, to Scotland, but within Scotland uh, as well. And if there is one area of that that epitomises that for me, it is the uh, Crown Estate. It's been um, long business for many of us who particularly represent the islands and who have the marine environment to consider on a day-to-day -day basis uh, that the uh, Crown Estate responsibilities uh, do not just sit in Edinburgh, but the responsibilities and the management power, not just money and not just the net finance, but are devolved to uh, the islands. And I hope that uh, in the next parliament, the, whoever is the government of the day and whoever is the Deputy First Minister or the First Minister is able to uh, fully deliver what the Smith, Smith Commission agreed in that area, what was, which was those, those powers and those finances would be devolved to the island uh, heirs and indeed to other island heirs out with the ones that I'm fortunate enough uh, to uh, represent. May I also uh, c uh, agree with uh, Bruce Crawford's observations on the devolution powers, uh, further powers committee. I don't know what I will do with a Thursday morning from now on after the heaven knows how many uh, running Thursdays we have had, although I thought tomorrow was going to be a nice quiet day. I could have maybe read a few papers and caught up with a bit of background reading, but oh no, I've got to go and speak on crofting law tomorrow morning. So from the sublime to the, well, to crofting law, any, uh, anyway. Um, let me uh, thank Bruce Crawford in particular for his uh, very patient and sensible uh, convenership of that uh, committee. The fact that we just about produced a report that uh, had all party agreement was down to his skills and to his patience. Uh, and the very few points that uh, Alec Johnson dissents for, for, for entirely uh, understandable political reasons are, are uh, in the overall scheme of things, uh, I would suggest fairly minor. It is no mean achievement uh, on the constitution, given the makeup of this place, uh, to come up with a broadly acceptable package uh, for all. May I make two final points, if I may, presiding officer, even one, um, since you're waving at me. Um, let me just make, uh, let me make one. The one area that I do want the Deputy First Minister just to consider carefully is that the review that has been institutionalised in this Fiscal Commission report, I think is very, very significant. And what it may do in terms of creating problems in the future, I, don't, does, I do believe needs to be reflected on uh, very closely so that we genuinely achieve all that we might out of this uh, consent motion when it is passed later today. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Alex Salmond. This is Mr Salmond's final speech in the Parliament. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I, can I start by congratulating both Annabel Goldie and Duncan McNeill on the, the, the service to this Parliament. Their contribution has been substantial indeed. Uh, I would say to Duncan McNeill for that, I'd be aware of taking too many lessons from the uh, Palace of Westminster. I was in the Commons yesterday and I, I glanced up at the House of Lords in Unseater and it had the words adjournment for the leisure period. <laughs> now, I'll have to ask Annabel what to do with their time when the adjournment <laughs> is on. And maybe it would be popular to introduce it into this parliament. Uh, who knows? Once we find out exactly what takes place uh, in that, uh, that timescale. <laughs> I would also join with uh, Duncan McNeill in thanking uh, my constituency staff, the parliamentary staff, uh, and the governmental staff, without whom no contribution in this place would have been possible in any of our uh, careers. Now, I'm aware, uh, presiding officer, in making a valedictory address that there's a major rival attraction down south today. However, on balance, uh, I feel that the champion chase at Cheltenham Racecourse <laughs> will, will not be overshadowed by my remarks. Uh, I'm grateful for, for the opportunity provided by this debate to reflect on the position that this parliament and this country is now in. The legislative consent motion before us clearly does not pave the way for near federalism or devil to the max or home rule, all things raised in the last days of the referendum. However, it does represent a further transfer of power from London to Scotland. That much should be welcomed. It is also to be very much welcomed that 
thanks to the iron resolve of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, it was ensured that this was done according to the Smith principles of no financial loss. It is not immediately apparent that this would have been the outcome under other leadership of this Parliament. We should remember it is 10 years since a Labour First Minister suggested there should be no further transfer of power from London to Scotland, and five years since a Conservative leader said that a line should be drawn in the sand. This Parliament and this country are on a journey, and under these circumstances it is sometimes easier to, to see the full extent of the distance travelled when one is not at the very heart of the, of the battle. In my first speech to this chamber, I refuted the idea that we were a, a divided parliament representing a divided country. I suggested that we were not divided, but diverse. Now, all of us have experienced a, an extraordinary referendum campaign, one which was hard fought, certainly, but one which produced a level of democratic participation and engagement of which most societies can only dream of. Yes, we are a a country of different views, but we are not divided. There is, in fact, a broad consensus on the need for this Parliament to assume greater responsibility for the governance of Scotland. And we are definitely stronger, so much stronger, as a result of that. We should reflect on, on some of those that we have lost. Bashir Ahmed, John Farker Monroe, Tom McCabe, David McCletchie, Margaret MacDonald, five different individuals, five different parties, five different viewpoints, but still diverse rather than divided. Seventeen years ago, when this parliament was reconvened, Donald Dewar delivered the best speech of his life. In an elegant historical sweep, he described Scotland as a journey begun long ago, which has no end. In truth, we do well to debate more the, the history and culture of this country. It is a subject worthy of discussion, and after all, it's the real reason that this place exists. However, when Donald spoke, his administration was an executive, not a government. The parliament anguished every time it trespassed into reserved areas, and there were real doubts as to whether the fledgling parliament would stand the test of time. These questions are now over. There is no doubt as to the permanence of this institution, and the only question is at what pace will the Parliament, the Scottish people and their government assume further responsibility? Will that make us totally independent? Well, not in a, an absolute sense. All nations are interdependent one upon the other. That fact of life does not change regardless of the, the status of Scotland. However, the greater of our independence, the greater our ability to impact on the political environment around us, and the greater our power will be to determine the circumstances of our fellow citizens. It will be this Parliament which decides to intervene to protect the dispossessed, as we have done over the bedroom tax. It shall be this Parliament which determines the life chances of the future, as we have done in nursery education. And it shall be this Parliament which places no financial barrier on human potential, as we have done by the abolition of tuition fees. I hope and believe that one day soon it will be this place which removes weapons of mass destruction from Scotland, this place which decides to fully commit to a renewable future, and this place which acts not just to secure but to develop Scotland's proper position in the mainstream of Europe. I wish all members well in their choices. For those retiring, you have done the nation some service. For those moving on to new careers, then, Think well of this Parliament. For those standing for election, then I wish you all luck, albeit with varying degrees of enthusiasm. <laughs> Let me uh, leave you with these final thoughts. There is no greater honour in public life than to be a member of this Parliament. There is no greater task than to, to mould the public purpose of Scotland. There is no greater cause than to serve that of the people of this country. And so with that, it is uh, goodbye from me. For now. <laughs>
On, on behalf of the panel, can I thank you for your contribution as an MSP and as the First Minister of Scotland. You've served the Parliament and Scotland with distinction, and I thank you for that. The Parliament will certainly be a much duller place without you. We wish you well in all you do in the future. Stuart Maxwell to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I, I believe that today represents another significant step on the journey of this Parliament, and I feel privileged to have played a part in that process as a member of the Devolution Further Powers Committee. And in fact, before that, I was a member of the Independence Referendum Bill Committee, and before that, the Scotland Bill Committee. So I think I've served on uh, a considerable part of, of that journey. Scotland's devolution package is changing although perhaps not to the extent that many of us had hoped. During the independence referendum campaign, we heard Gordon Brown promise that a no vote would result in the devolution of further powers that would ensure that we get as close to federalism as it's possible to get. We also heard the current Prime Minister say that the Scotland Bill would make Scotland one of the most powerful devolved legislatures in the world. Now, in my view, neither of these promises have been met. And in, in fact, that's also the view of the majority of the Devolution Committee. The Scotland Bill could have and should have done more to strengthen the powers of this Parliament. Presiding officer, I very much welcome the transfer of any further powers to the Scottish Parliament, but let's put this bill into the proper context. Under this settlement, Westminster will continue to control around 70% of tax raising powers and a hugely significant proportion of powers over welfare and social security. So whilst the Scottish Parliament will have power over additional areas, it will still be without the full powers it needs to completely protect public services and tackle inequality and transform this country in the way that it deserves. Nonetheless, further powers are coming to this Parliament, and I welcome the First Minister's commitment that the SNP and Government will use these powers to keep Scotland moving forward. In fact, we have already started doing just that. On Monday, the Scottish Government launched a consultation on its plans to reform APD, which is, of course, one of the powers being transferred to Holyrood under the Scotland Bill. A report last week by the British Air Transport Association said that the UK APD rate for long-haul flights is the highest in the world. And whilst this may or may not be okay for London's airports, it certainly holds back the potential of Scotland's airports, including Glasgow Airport. APD, at its current rate, restricts Scotland's ability to attract and retain direct international routes. Now, I strongly believe that the Scottish Government's plans to make Scotland more competitive in this area will be a real benefit to not only our tourism industry, it will also boost economic growth and create new job opportunities. There are several other new powers being developed which are worthy of comment, not least those over welfare. Earlier this month, Social Justice Secretary Alec Neill outlined initial plans for the establishment of Scotland's new Social Security Agency, pledging to put dignity and respect at the heart of Scotland's devolved welfare system. Contrast this, presenting officer, to the approach to welfare taken by the Tories at Westminster, and the case is clear why these powers are better held in Scotland's hands rather than those of Westminster. Now, we will hear later today George Osborne's budget plans, but reports that the Chancellor wants to cut personal independence payments for more than 640,000 disabled people are deeply concerning. PIP is awarded to give disabled people access to simple aids and appliances that allow them to live independently. And charities have warned that these cuts will have a devastating impact on some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Those who can afford at least face losing up to £150 a week. And if it comes to pass, this is a particularly nasty and regressive step taken by the Chancellor. Let's just say that I wasn't surprised to read reports in the press that Ruth Davidson doesn't want George Osborne anywhere near Scotland during her party's Holyrood campaign. Indeed, figures published by the Institute for Fiscal Studies indicate that the number of children living in absolute poverty in the UK will increase by 2.6 million by 2020-21 as a result of the Chancellor's cuts to Social Security. We've seen the bedroom tax that Scotland can and will do things differently, and the sooner that further welfare powers are under the control of this Parliament, the better. Presenting officer, I want to turn now to the fiscal framework. As we've heard, at the start of negotiations, the Treasury tried to force a further reduction to Scotland's budget of £7 billion over the next 10 years. Many people have praised the Deputy First Minister and the First Minister for standing up to the Treasury and securing a fair deal for Scotland, and they have been right to do so. As a result of their hard work, 
there will not be any, any detriment to Scotland's budget, despite the Treasury's attempts at a cash grab. And in the future, the key success of these negotiations is that any attempt to impose a settlement on Scotland cannot happen without the agreement of the Scottish Government. This Government and this Parliament deserves that equality of esteem. Negotiations over the fiscal framework deal took the best part of a year. And as the, uh, our convener said in the Devolution Committee, it's unfortunate that these often difficult and certainly protracted discussions interfered somewhat in the Devolution Committee's scrutiny of the proposals. This is a point reflected in the Committee's final report and one that is worth considering in the context of intergovernmental relations in the future. Presiding Officer, the Devolution Father Powell's Committee has met almost 50 times since it was first set up in November 2014. In that time, we have engaged with numerous experts, witnesses, government officials and ordinary members of the public. I'd like to thank all those who helped to inform the Committee's work on the Bill. The dedication and diligence of the clerking team, the SPICE researchers and the press support staff also deserves our appreciation and our thanks. The work of this Parliament has undoubtedly been integral to making improvements to the Scotland Bill. I'm particularly pleased that the permanence of the Scottish Parliament has been recognised and that it will not be possible for it to be abolished without the will of the Scottish people as expressed in a democratic list, referendum. Presenting officer, I hope that as we approach the end of this Parliament, we do so with a sense of determination that will ensure that the next Parliament will use these new powers to make Scotland better and that all those who are fortunate enough to serve in that Parliament will aspire to deliver a fairer and more prosperous country. Many thanks. Uh, now, very tight for time this morning. Um, call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Up to six minutes, please. Not my final speech, for which I'm uh, very grateful, given the number of distinguished final speeches we've heard today. And I'd like to pay tribute to my colleague, uh, Duncan McNeill, who's been an outstanding chair of the Health Committee, as I found out during the last six months, but has also made a massive contribution to the Parliament in many other ways. And obviously pay tribute to uh, Alex Salmon, who has been a colleague of mine in two parliaments, and along with his colleagues, has changed Scottish politics in ways which uh, nobody on this side could have anticipated in 19. 99. I'm not sure if it was Annabel Goldie's uh, last speech or not, but I, I, I would also pay tribute uh, to her, certainly, for her many uh, political skills, including a friendly respect for opponents. Now, I've been so obsessed with the block grant adjustment that I'm slightly uh, in danger of uh, neglecting the other important parts of the Scotland Bill, but it was central to the whole uh, process. And if anyone doesn't understand all the final details of it, I can commend the technical annex, which actually describes it with uh, admiral clarity. But mainly I want to congratulate the uh, Scottish uh, Government for sticking to their guns on this, particularly in relation to the indexed uh, per capita uh, 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 method for the block grant adjustment. Now, I noticed at the Scottish uh, National Party conference in Scotland that the First Minister talked about the Treasury and said that we gubbed them. And I, I did think that this was not entirely positive for intergovernment relations, but I think it is a pretty uh, accurate uh, assessment uh, of uh, the situation. Uh, but I think it would probably be uh, courteous to also thank the UK Government for being prepared to uh, be flexible, no doubt uh, under duress, but I understand they started by advocating levels deductions, which would be a total disaster for this Parliament. They then were prepared to move to, I always have to check I get this right, tax capacity adjusted level uh, deduction, which was an improvement, and that's the method that's the fundamental method that's going to be used before the adjustment. But then, of course, they gave way for at least five years. And I know Stuart Maxwell and others are, are concerned about what's going to uh, happen in five years' time, but it's in the agreement that nothing's prejudged. Both sides uh, must agree. And, and my view is so much is going to change in politics in the next five years. We're going to have all the figures for the two methods over the last, next five years. So I really think we shouldn't get too exercised about uh, that uh, at this moment in time. I think the main potential area of controversy over the next five years is these spillover uh, effects. You know, there's talk about direct effects. Uh, and behavioural effects with a material impact and they have to be taken account of and that's a bit of a grey area as many of the people who gave evidence to our committee have said but John Swinney last week said the Scottish Fiscal Commission would have a role in that as well as the OBR uh, and hopefully that will be resolved. We don't need to go over last week's debate on the Scottish Fiscal Commission but I'm glad about their uh, new role. I think one other area of outstanding concern is to do with the publication of documents. John Swinney said 
that he would like to publish a range of documents. The Treasury appears to be against this, but it would be helpful in the summing up if John Swinney could explain exactly what documents he has in mind now, because clearly we have the technical annex, which is the most important document, but uh, other ones obviously are relevant. Now, moving on from that area, uh, again, um, Bruce Crawford tribute to him in particular uh, because of the work of his committee, which I only joined belatedly because I think uh, as many of the changes did flow from their recommendations. The, the Scottish Parliament, the, the permanence of the Scottish Parliament is more securely in legislation now. There's been progress in equality, particularly with reference to quotas on boards, which we now have powers to do, uh, undisputed powers. Um, and also, of course, there are the various uh, social security uh, changes which, uh, which some other people uh, have uh, mentioned. For example, there was a new clause in the bill about new benefits in areas of devolved competence in the uh, fiscal framework agreement. There's, says there's to be no clawback if there's a new benefit in a devolved area. There's a removal of the restriction on competence for carers' allowance. There's flex well, what was described as the veto on uh, um, universal credit flexibilities is now only a matter of timing, which is an improvement. And also there's a removement, removing of the restrictions on uh, discretionary uh, housing payments. So I think there was progress during the course uh, of the bill. Some concern still about the, what's in the, in the bill about the Sewell uh, Convention. It doesn't cover all the strands of that. So there are still uh, areas, uh, some small, some larger, where obviously people would have liked to go further. One of the key ones flagged up by the Devolution More Powers Committee in relation to employment. I certainly support, uh, support uh, in a previous debate about wanting, for example, the access to work programme to be devolved, which uh, hasn't happened. And there's also concern that the amount of money that we're getting for the programmes we have responsibility for has reduced because of UK government policy changes from 53 million to 7 billion. So, of course, there are, uh, there are um, uh, disappointments there. And we all know, of course, this is all governed by in terms of how, how much money we get for welfare by how much the UK government spending on welfare. So as that's reduced, that is a matter uh, of uh, concern. But having said that, uh, I think uh, we have uh, many reasons uh, to celebrate um, the changes that have been made, but also, of course, many of the proposals that were in the uh, original uh, bill. So this, today is not the day really to talk about the use of these tax powers. Obviously, we have disagreements on that, and my latest disagreement, although I've expressed it before, was relation into air passenger duty. But for another day, well, probably not for another day for me on air passenger duty, this is probably the last uh, debate I shall do with, uh, with John Swift so it's appropriate for me also, since I, he's been my colleague in two parliaments, to pay uh, respect to, to what I regard as his manifest uh, political abilities. And, and as I said, uh, in relation to Annabel Goldie, one of those is certainly a friendly respect for opponents as well. Many thanks. I now call on Mark MacDonald to be followed by Leslie Brennan. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, Having served as a member of both the Devolution of Further Powers Committee and the Finance Committee of this Parliament, I cannot help but feel that a gaping hole is about to open in my life uh, as the Scotland Bill and the fiscal framework discussions uh, no longer play such a prominent role. Um, but I want to pay uh, tribute, presiding officer, to the convenership of Bruce Crawford. Uh, it, the, one of the necessities of a Thursday morning committee is that uh, the timescale can be truncated in terms of the ability to take evidence, and that requires uh, the convener to run a tight ship. And I think most people would accept that, uh, in that respect, Mr Crawford ran a very tight ship, uh, but at the same time uh, was very cognisant of the fact that he wanted to ensure that all members of that committee had an opportunity to have their input to the evidence-taking sessions. So I think uh, he, he is to be congratulated wholeheartedly on his efforts in that regard. Uh, and also the clerking team, who have put in uh, a phenomenal amount of work uh, to make sure that the committee was kept well briefed, well informed, uh, and fed and watered as well, which uh, was always welcome. Um, in terms of the uh, debate that we've had so far today, um, I think uh, we have seen a number of very thoughtful contributions, particularly the final contributions uh, in this parliament from Annabel Goldie, Alex Hammond uh, and Duncan McNeill. And I was interested when Duncan O'Neill uh, analogised the Scottish Parliament's transition to uh, that of uh, somebody uh, attaining uh, 
you know, the various stages of life uh, and spoke of how the, there had been a threat to leave, uh, but that now, as, as a 17-year-old, uh, we had de decided to stay and were uh, instead going to earn more of our own keep. And I would merely point out that I personally left home finally at the age of 24, so I'm very much <laughs> looking forward to how the next seven years uh, of the Parliament's journey will develop. But uh, what, what I wanted to look at, um, signing off, sir, having served on both devolution and further powers and on the finance committee, I thought it would be remiss of me not to look a little bit at the fiscal framework and also some of the financial uh, elements that, that relate. I think um, what was very clear very early on was that there was a, a, a disagreement, I think we would term it, in terms of what no detriment constituted uh, in relation to how the fiscal framework was to operate. And I think it is uh, a testament to the, the, the negotiating skills of the Deputy First Minister that he was able to uh, arrive at a position where the Treasury uh, agreed with the definition that the Scottish Government applied, albeit uh, there was perhaps a slightly more tortuous route taken to get to the methodology um, because the Treasury seemed unwilling to sign up to what the Scottish Government had initially put on the table. In terms of how um, things will operate in future, I think there are a number of areas which this Parliament is going to have to pay very close attention to and give very careful scrutiny to. The first is in relation to um, tax avoidance and tax evasion, because in terms of the collection of income tax and the Scottish income tax, uh, that will remain the preserve of HMRC. And while the Scottish Government in establishing Revenue Scotland for the collection uh, of land and buildings transaction tax and landfill tax uh, has established a very strong uh, and uh, widely regarded as very strong anti-avoidance mechanism within uh, that legislation, we are aware that there is still a great deal of tax that goes unpaid at a UK level. And so there will be a need to scrutinise the measures that are being taken by HMRC in relation to the collection of Scottish income tax, because that will have a material impact on the funds that are available to this Parliament for future use. The second is around some of the limitations that do exist. And I think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm not seeking to, to play down the role that um, this Parliament will have in terms of setting tax rates uh, and bans in the future. But we should also remember that there are elements of income tax that will still not be in the preserve of this Parliament. The first is around the personal allowance uh, and the second is around savings and dividend income. And should individuals be in a position to transfer income from uh, their, their regular income into dividend income, that money would not be readily available to this Parliament. It would flow instead to the Treasury through dividend. And there would be a, I think there needs to be uh, some consideration uh, given over time. If that proves to be uh, material, how we go about addressing some of that. And I think the, the, the final point I would make, presiding officer, is that I think with, with these powers coming and with the experience that we've had in relation to how land and buildings transaction tax uh, has, has operated since it, was, since it was established and the forestalling that we saw at the initial stage, we need, I think, as a parliament to consider how we do things in terms of our budget setting processes in future because we are now going to be in a position where we will be, uh, in, as part of that budget process, announcing uh, potentially changes to tax rates, changes to tax bans, and that obviously potentially triggers behavioural change uh, amongst those who would be paying. And the further out that that change is signposted, the more uh, likely it becomes that behavioural change will take effect, and that has an impact in both that financial year and then also the coming financial year in which the changes are to take effect. So I think that we need to look very carefully at the way that the budgets are constructed within this parliament, how they are consulted upon, and we need to rethink some of the old thinking, which, which was, which was fine when we please. were only responsible for dealing with a block grant, uh, and we didn't have to worry about the potential behavioural changes that might come. Uh, but in future years, uh, if we are to be uh, expecting a finance secretary to stand up and announce the potential tax rates some six months in advance. We have to bear in mind the behavioural effects that that could give rise to, and I think we have to consider what we do with those uh, and how we set budgets in future. Many thanks. Now call on Leslie Brennan to be followed by Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you. It's a great honour to speak in this debate and to follow so many great parliamentarians who have shaped this place over the last 17 years. And also to speak in the debate as someone who's followed this process, not as a parliamentarian, but as just an ordinary punter and a local councillor. So I wish to address three areas in the Scotland Bill that have often been overlooked and where I hope the Parliament 
We'll use new powers to address inequalities, and these areas are funeral payments, fixed odds, betting terminals, and abortion. I welcome the devolution of the benefits uh, for funeral expenses, and with the duty of providing financial assistance to meet or reduce funeral expenses that will move from Westminster to the Scottish Government. Funeral costs can impose a considerable financial burden on those left behind, and the burden not only reflects that funeral costs are subject to market forces, but also that bereavement in itself may cause financial hardship. I hope that the Scottish Government can improve the current process of applying for a, a social fund funeral payment, which is known to be uncertain and complicated due to confusion around eligibility and the way in which family relationships are assessed and how decisions regarding the responsibility for funeral costs are made. Claimants are often left feeling frustrated and with an increased sense of shame for being unable to afford fun the funeral for their family member. Research suggests that only 55% uh, of claimants who receive a funeral payment award experience a substantial shortfall between the contribution and the amount of the, the cost of the funeral. Scottish Government data uh, suggests that the typical award is approximately £1,300 whereas the average cost of a funeral is about £3,500. So I hope the next Scottish Government will rectify this and eradicate funeral poverty in Scotland. Now I wish to turn to part four of the other legislative competence, point 51, gaming machines on licensed betting premises. I occasionally uh, enjoy a punt. I used to work as a career for a few years and I saw how gambling can negatively affect people's lives. And as an academic, I did research in this area. Since becoming a councillor in Dundee in 2012, I've raised concerns about the proliferation of gambling opportunities, particularly fixed odds betting terminals. And in March 2014, all councillors in Dundee agreed a problem gambling policy, which de detailed a number of innovative steps to minimise harm from gambling. At that time, the research noted that in Dundee, there were 30 gambling venues and 19 of them, so it's 63%, within 500 metres of areas designated as the most deprived. This is particularly concerning as research results from the British Gambling Prevalence Study shows a significant correlation between problem gambling with household income, with those in the lowest income categories nearly three times as likely as the average to be defined as a problem gambler. Those not in paid work and those in manual occupations are we're also significantly more likely to be a problem gambler. So I hope in the next session, these newly devolved powers will be used to address the need for greater control over fixed odds betting terminals. And I hope that they... Yeah? Stuart McMillan. Well, I thank Lesley Brennan for taking the intervention, but uh, will Lesley Brennan agree with me and accept that the powers that actually are in this bill to come to this parliament are very much limited? And no matter what happens with them, we will still be very limited to what we can actually do with them. Leslie Brennan. I agree that they're, they're narrow in their scope, but I think we could actually do, I think they could actually do a great deal of good. And I would suggest that actually the, the, the Parliament consider actually devolving this power to local authorities, because I think the local authorities are the best place to actually take these decisions. Lastly, I want to turn to part four, other legislative competence, and point 52, abortion. I was deeply disappointed by the decision of the Greens to push for the devolution of abortion during the Smith Commission. And I was angry with David Mundell's decision to devolve abortion as he could, and I quote, not see a convincing constitutional reason why abortion law should not be devolved. In the run up to the referendum in Dundee East, where I was working, the team and I spoke to 15,000 people and not one man or woman mentioned to us and when people I spoke to across Scotland, no one was mentioned about why abortion should be devolved. To me, abortion is a human rights issue. And I strongly believe that abortion rules ought to be the same across the UK, i.e. they ought to be extended to women in Northern Ireland. Thus, I was not in favour of this being devolved. And I do not raise this lightly, and I say this as a Catholic woman and mother. However, Evidence uncovered by Abortion Rights Scotland, Hannah Pearson and other researchers at the University of Glasgow since 2014 has illuminated the various geographical vari uh, variations across the UK and Scotland. 
Abortion for non-medical reasons is generally not provided in Scotland after 18 to 20 weeks, despite the legal limit in Great Britain being 24 weeks, meaning that women seeking a late termination in Scotland are forced to travel to England. So while this procedure is funded by NHS Scotland, the cost of travel and accommodation is funded by the woman, which is unacceptable. Could you draw to a close, please? Yep. This leads to stigmatisation. So I hope, that, given the, the findings, that this is uh, rectified and that the women who are seeking a late abortion in Scotland can do so in Scotland. And I hope, with the new powers, actually there are further improvements in this area in Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. We now move to Alison Johnston to be followed by Stuart McMillan. I'm sorry, I can only give you five minutes, Ms Johnston. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. At times during the year and a half I've had the pleasure to sit on the Further Powers Committee, I have wondered whether this day would ever come. And then if we were finally to debate the LCM, whether the committee would have a unanimous view and what that view might be. And as colleagues have rightly stated, uh, that we've got to this position to be able to recommend with unanimity to the Parliament that it gives consent is in no small part due to the work of our clerks, witnesses, our advisers, to SPICE, to the Solicitor's Office and to our convener, Bruce Crawford. I was really pleased to have the opportunity to witness Duncan McNeil roll his sleeves up and see him in action. And I too would like to thank him for his contribution to this Parliament and wish him all the very best for the future. And I would also like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to Alex Hammond for his contribution. Um, to, to colleagues, I'd like to thank you all too. I think we all just demonstrated a willingness to work constructively on issues which have great potential to polarise. And I believe that we can be proud that the legislation has been strengthened in several notable areas as highlighted as a result of the scrutiny of this committee and all committees involved. Now, undoubtedly, questions will continue to be asked and debate will go on. Does the Bill honour the agreement of the five parties in Scotland? Are the Smith Commission recommendations delivered in full? But what I'd like to focus on in the few minutes I have left is where we are now. I am clear that the Scotland Bill and the agreed fiscal framework have the potential to enable Scotland to take progressive strides in a direction with more opportunities and positive outcomes for the people of Scotland. I acknowledge that there are many of us in this chamber who will continue to feel constrained frustrated that we must endure cuts that we would not vote for and who will continue to build the case for independence from the ground up. And there'll be those in this chamber who feel that these powers are sufficient. But in the meantime, we do have a duty to positively discuss, debate and use the new powers to improve the lives of people in Scotland. It's up to us to see that they're used to their very best effect. Scotland's government and Scotland's parliament, have not, have, we have an opportunity to sketch out a vision and begin to deliver it. So the purpose of this debate isn't to steer policy for 20 years. It's about the powers we know we have within the fiscal framework that has been agreed for the next five years. Let's focus on these powers and on Scottish solutions to the challenges we face. Let's become a bolder parliament. That won't be achieved simply by focusing on what the UK government is, is doing. We have powers that will enable us to do much more than decide whether or not to add one P uh, to the UK's income tax rate. At a local level, management often revenues from many of the economic assets of the Crown Estate in Scotland will enable us to invest in and unlock the power in our communities. We are agreed, as Tavish Scott has said, that devolution must not stop here in Holyrood. When decisions are made closer to home, local communities can decide how they want to use their rural land. It will give communities the ability to invest in local priorities. Power over oil and gas licensing will enable us to further ensure that Scotland rejects even more unequivocally and even more powerfully applications to further endanger our local and global environment and health and ban fracking for once and for all. Now, the most recent GERS figures highlight the need for a just transition to a low-carbon economy. We have the potential to not only match but exceed the renewables output of many of our European neighbours. It's clear, unfortunately, that the Westminster government has an ideological dislike for clean green energy, energy that lends itself to democratic community ownership and is thwarting the development of renewables here. But we must do all that we can with these new powers to invest in the low carbon economy that will bring real energy security and job security. 
Presiding officer, due to the incredibly tight timescales involved in our scrutiny and in the debate today, I am unable to properly discuss the potential of the devolution of energy efficiency and schemes to mitigate fuel poverty. But we will have the ability to change the design of the system to provide us with an opportunity to look at how the system could be improved and adapted to suit Scotland's particular circumstances, our housing, our weather. We can do more with these powers. We can better care for all who care in Scotland. Let's make sure that these powers increase the carer's allowance to a level that properly recognises this important work. Presiding officer, in closing, I'd like to make sure that we do all we can to include Scotland at its widest as this discussion goes forward. I know that sometimes discussions have to take place behind closed doors, but let's be as transparent as possible. And I would just like to say in response, it is absolutely right and proper that abortion be dissolved to this parliament. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Stuart McMillan, after which we'll move the closing speeches up to five minutes. Please, Mr McMillan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And certainly, it certainly has been a privilege uh, to serve on the Devolution Further Powers Committee and the uh, predecessor uh, committees in this Parliament. It uh, certainly has been a, uh, an interesting and fabulous journey to be on. Uh, before I, I touch upon the, the, the actual uh, the report on the LCM, I'd just like to offer just a, a couple of brief comments regarding uh, uh, three speakers uh, before in this debate. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, commend uh, the MSP for Aberdeenshire East uh, and obviously this is his uh, final speech uh, today. Uh, it was under the leadership of Mr Salmon to actually encourage me to join uh, the SNP uh, and, uh, and certainly for the, the, the whole desire and campaign for independence and also um, his leadership in the minority administration between 2007 and 2011 certainly helped uh, this parliament grow in stature but also the people of Scotland's confidence grow and I wish you well in your future Mr Salmond. I also want to uh, offer uh, some comments to Duncan McNeill and Annabel Goldie. Um, obviously we've had uh, regular dealings since uh, 2007 uh, and uh, certainly uh, we haven't had too many fights which is something that, uh, that I warmly welcome. Uh, but it's also something that uh, I believe that, the, the, uh, that the, apart from obviously Mr. McNeill rolling up his, uh, his sleeves at the moment, uh, but it's certainly something that, uh, that the public, I, I believe that the public actually want to see their politicians uh, try to work together when they possibly can. Clearly we have political differences, but uh, I think in the main uh, we certainly have attempted to do that uh, since, uh, since 2007, and I wish you both very well in the future. Regarding the, the, the debate uh, in front of us today, um, this report that I am, uh, I've certainly been very uh, happy to put my name uh, to the report our committee has undertaken and uh, certainly I think one of the things about it was about uh, we looked at uh, has the, will the bill actually deliver uh, both the spirit uh, and the, well, both the letter and the spirit of the Smith Commission uh, recommendations. Now, there are some key issues where uh, that the bill actually, or well, this hasn't happened. There's some, uh, some areas where the Scotland bill still falls short of the spirit and substance of what Smith actually proposed. But uh, there are some issues where uh, that, uh, that I will touch upon uh, with the remaining uh, contribution. One of which is uh, the fixed odds uh, betting terminals. Uh, now, uh, Leslie Brennan spoke about this a few moments ago. Uh, and it's something that I, I've had this, uh, I've raised this in previously in the Parliament. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the draft clauses, when we looked at them, they certainly, there was a concern there that the fixed odds betting terminals and the main element of power and regulation must still remain with Westminster. And unfortunately, this is where uh, the bill, the Scotland bill, actually st uh, still falls short of what Smith actually has recommended with the proliferation of these fixed odds betting terminals. The current clauses within the bill also, uh, uh, are also very, very limited. They confine the Scottish Parliament to dealing with gaming machines where it's possible to stake more than £10 in a single game. And this only applies to betting premises licensed after the date on which this clause will come into force. Now, I certainly would like to thank the Local Government and Regeneration Committee uh, for their input into this particular issue. Now, this committee carried out extensive work on the issue of fixed odds betting terminals and supported the principle that the Scotland Bill provisions should apply to existing betting premises. Now, this would give the Scottish Parliament real and effective legislative powers to address the concerns that there are too many fixed odds betting terminal machines in Scotland. Paragraphs 5 to 3 uh, of the Devolution uh, Committee report highlights uh, the evidence supplied uh, to, by the Scottish Government and also paragraph 681 highlights our recommendation that the bill falls far short of fixed odds betting terminals. 
The second issue is that of the Crown Estate. Now, Tavis Scott spoke about it earlier on, and, and uh, my colleague Rob Gibson, uh, when going through the, the evidence sessions, highlighted the, the issue of the Crown Estate on a regular basis. Presenting also the issues of the Crown Estate, uh, many issues were raised uh, regarding uh, the, the situation regarding the future devolution and also that of Fort Kinnaird. Now, paragraph 670 to 672 welcomes the agreement reached regarding the management of the Crown Estate assets and the revenue generated from these assets. Uh, but uh, they also highlight the further, de further devolution of the powers to the island communities. But paragraph 673 highlights where the committee believed the UK government didn't agree with us and how uh, they drafted the clauses. Unfortunately, this approach wasn't agreed to. Now, presenting also, I am conscious, uh, you know, I've only got five uh, minutes, and I'm just about to conclude. Presenting also, it's, uh, I certainly have been delighted to be a member of this committee, and I want to pay tribute to the convener, uh, Bruce Crawford, for how he has handled uh, all uh, of our deliberations and also the collegiate fashion with which he has worked with uh, the previous deputy conveners and also including uh, Duncan McNeill. Uh, but uh, our, the members of the committee would be nothing uh, without the assistance, the fabulous assistance from the Clarkin team uh, and also everyone who's gave evidence to the committee. And for that, I want to pay tribute to them also because uh, they do a uh, huge amount of work please. that sometimes isn't always recognised. Thank you very much. Many thanks. And we now move to closing speeches. Very tight for time, up to six minutes. Mr Johnson, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is a debate that comes at the end of a very important process. But as Ian Gray said, uh, it, uh, on a damp Wednesday morning, it perhaps had the potential to be a damp squib. There are two reasons why that has not happened. The first, of course, is that it's been an opportunity for a number of our distinguished members uh, to make what will be their final contributions uh, to this Parliament. Uh, I pay particular tribute to Annabel Goldie, uh, to Duncan McNeill, uh, who got an extraordinary length of time to speak and I think shortened this debate for most other people. But given his experience, I think that's sensible. Uh, and finally, of course, Alex Salmond. Uh, however, listening to Alex Salmond's final remarks, I was suffering a bit from deja vu because like some of the me other members in this parliament, I think we've heard him do that before. Uh, and the, the thing that worried me most was that he finished his speech by saying goodbye for now. So there's a possibility that he may be planning in his role as the Muhammad Ali of Scottish politics to make that second comeback. So let's watch this space. Nevertheless, uh, again, as Ian Gray said earlier, uh, I am genuinely excited by the opportunities that this process has represented. Uh, and it's been my pleasure to be a part of the Devolution Further Powers Committee during the last 18 months to see how this has matured and come to fruition. It's been a fascinating process, and it was kicked off, of course, by the referendum campaign and the outcome of that referendum. We had the VOW, we had the Smith Commission, and then eventually we had the Scotland Bill. And while many criticised uh, or uh, pointed at the UK government suggesting they would not stick to the timescales they had committed to, that was never the case and the UK government has worked to deliver on that. I'd like to pay particular tribute to David Mundell for the work that he's done in guiding the bill through Westminster. It is in my view that the reason why David Mundell understood so well the processes that were in, in tune and delivered the bill in the way he did was that he benefited from having had six years as a member of this parliament. And that that combination of experience in the two parliaments was what delivered a, a, a near at the other end of that channel, which this parliament could communicate with. And I hope the government uh, shared that quality experience in working with David. But the, important part of this whole process, of course, was the fiscal framework. And I think the negotiations towards achieving uh, an agreement on the fiscal framework were the uh, most important part of this process for more reasons than one. A lot has been said about parity of esteem. And sometimes that parity of esteem between two governments can deteriorate into being something akin to parity of contempt. But it was parity. And that's where this process has demonstrated a maturing of the devolved settlement and a maturing of the relationship between Scotland's two governments. I think the achievement of the fiscal framework agreement has delivered a good deal for Scotland. 
It has put in place a deal that will reflect the, the figures that would have been generated by the Barnett formula uh, and will, as a result, mean that over the next five years, Scotland will be much better off than it would have been under any form of fiscal autonomy or, heaven help us, independence. So Scotland has got a good deal and the UK Government have delivered on its promise. That's what brings us today to the point of agreeing the legislative consent motion. And of course the Conservatives at decision time today will support that legislative consent motion because we believe this is a good deal for Scotland. However, reflecting on the comments that have been made, particularly by some of the government's backbenchers, I think there is still a failure to understand what this deal delivers. Scotland now has a mature parliament and a government that will, over the period of its next session, have, have the power to make decisions that will influence how things are done in Scotland. We've heard a few speeches that have been the typical backbenchers, spend, spend, spend uh, approach to Scottish Government. But this change is about accountability. Tough decisions will have to be made about taxation. And the Scottish Government at the end of its next five year period will have to go to the Scottish people and account for the decisions it made on how money was raised, not just on how money was spent. That is where this delivers maturity. That is where this deal delivers accountability. And that is why we on the Conservative side believe that this deal is a very important move forward in the maturing of Scotland's parliamentary democracy and self-governance. The truth is that the, the more Scotland's two governments work together, the more the union dividend delivers for the Scottish people, and the more this Parliament addresses its responsibilities rather than using its power to, uh, to generate grievances, the more people will realise that the decision in 2014 was the right one, as you draw to a close, that the please. UK Government has delivered on its promises and that Scotland will be the better for it. We support the motion in the name of John Swinney. Many thanks. Now call on Jackie Bailey. Up to seven minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me start by paying tribute to Duncan McNeill. Now, I've known Duncan for more years than I care to remember, and in fact, we worked together for a period long before the Parliament was established. And I can safely say, without fear of any contradiction, Presiding Officer, that he has always been challenging, not just in this place. He sometimes says the things that no one else would say but he is certainly worth listening to. And I am happy, of course, to share some of my more interesting treasure trove of stories in a less public forum. Um, fiercely loyal to his constituents, very direct in his approach, you were never in any doubt about what Duncan was thinking. And I think many people across this chamber will miss his contribution and the twinkle in his eye that told you he was up to something. Annabelle Goldie, likewise, has been a superb parliamentarian and has worked across this parliament um, in order to make progress, and I wish her well in the House of Commons. And let me also wish the former First Minister well. Sorry, in the House of Lords, I demoted you. Actually, it's probably a promotion, but there you go. But let me also wish the former First Minister well in his new career in the House of Commons, um, or should I say his second career in the House of Commons. And in echoing his comments, there are certainly some people we will miss more than others, but we will certainly miss um, the fact that this parliament will be a, a less noisy place without him and indeed without all three of them. Let me turn to the wide ranging debate that we've had this morning and start by thanking um, the members and clerks of the Devolution Further Powers Committee and the Finance Committee as well. I also want to thank those that served tirelessly on the Smith Commission, in particular Lord Smith of Kelvin, who steered the entire process with considerable skill and patience. What he achieved was a consensus, however momentary that was, that has resulted in the biggest transfer of powers since the Parliament was established in 1999. And for that, we should all be grateful. This will now be a powerhouse Parliament. Ian Gray was right to remind us that the Val promised three things. The entrenchment of the Scottish Parliament, the devolution of substantial powers over taxation and welfare, and the protection of Barnet, all of which have been delivered today. 
with the transfer of disability living allowance, personal independence payment, attendance allowance, carers allowance, mutability, severe disability, the Sure Start grant, cold weather pay, it goes on and on. This is a serious and substantial set of welfare powers. The ability to create our own benefits gives us the flexibility to respond to needs. And of course, the housing component of universal credit gives us the opportunity to scrap the bedroom tax once and for all in Scotland, and I would urge the Scottish Government to do so immediately. And we also have substantial new powers over taxation too. The power to set the rates and thresholds of income tax, devolution of air passenger duty, aggregates levy, assignment of VAT, and an increased range and level of borrowing as well. But of course, with these new powers come new responsibilities. Not just spending what somebody else gives us, but responsibility for raising income as well. Grown-up politics, that is about the choices we make, about the kind of country we are, and the kind of country we aspire to be. And in that context of new responsibilities, we need enhanced scrutiny. So I'm pleased that the Scottish Government and John Swinney has changed his mind and agreed to having a Scottish Fiscal Commission, which is responsible for producing the official budgetary and economic forecasts. This came about as a consequence of the UK Government's insistence, and therefore I very much welcome the fiscal framework um, that brought that about. Because the fiscal framework is as important as the Scotland Bill itself. Making sure there is a robust agreement that governs our financial arrangements is critical. We on these benches supported the Scottish Government in pursuing the principle of no detriment and urged Mr Swinney to stay at the table to get the best deal possible for Scotland. And I think the Parliament can be broadly content with the result. So let me join for the second time um, in the space of weeks in the chorus of praise for John Swinney and his negotiating skills and pass over the temptation offered by Ian Gray to enumerate his flaws. Can I lay down a marker though? Because I do think the agreement over the budget allocation formula is for five years. It is right that it should be subject to independent review. But the fact that there is a difference between the view of the Deputy First Minister and the Chief Secretary to the Treasury as to what would happen should no agreement be reached after that period suggests that there is the potential for difficulty in the future. Now, I absolutely hope that that is not the case, but I would suggest that the Successor Finance Committee pay attention to this area because I think that's important moving forward. Presiding officer, this is now about how we use these new powers. Scottish Labour have already set out our initial plans, a penny on income tax, to ensure that we invest in education and public services, a 50 pence new tax level for those earning over 150,000, more than doubling the maternity grant to cover a, uh, to over 1,000 pounds, and there will be more to follow. But you know, there should be no limit to the ambition of this parliament. We should use the powers to tackle child poverty, use the powers to create jobs, use the powers to grow the economy, use the powers to make our social security system fairer. We can no longer blame Westminster for absolutely everything. There is much we can criticize the Tories for, but the real challenge to us as a grown-up institution is what we would do differently. Don't squander this chance by doing nothing because there really is no excuse anymore. Huge areas of policy, huge areas of action are now ours. Let the next parliament be about how we will use those new powers to create a better Scotland. Many thanks. We now call on John Swinney, up to eight minutes. Mr Swinney, please. Presiding officer, one of the fascinating and important points of this debate has been the recognition across the political spectrum about the strength of the analysis that's been undertaken by the Devolution for the Powers Committee in this parliament which tells us two things, it tell, and that, that's been expressed right across the parliamentary chamber, it tells us two things about this process. It tells us, firstly, that we do have a very strong committee system in this parliament, and we should be proud of it, and we should respect it. And secondly, it demonstrates the necessity of good, strong, effective, dispassionate leadership in our committees. And Bruce Crawford has clearly demonstrated that, as has been uh, recorded by members of all uh, political persuasions in Parliament today. Now, the one point of the debate which, I, which did surprise me 
was a comment by Malcolm Chisholm, um, where he said that there was admirable clarity on the block grant adjustment in the fiscal, the technical annex of the fiscal framework. I only, well, well I, I, I'm, I'm going to come to Mr. Chisholm's Twitter feed because I noticed this morning on his Twitter feed that Mr. Chisholm said that he fell asleep over the equations in the fiscal framework technical accents, but it was crystal clear at four o'clock this morning. <laughs> that did encourage me that, um, well, first of all, that the equations are really quite challenging at pages eight and nine in the technical annex, but I'm also glad to hear that somebody else has to get up at four o'clock in the morning to cope with life. Um, uh, but can I, on a serious note, thank Malcolm Chisholm for the insight that he demonstrated on the fiscal framework issues and on the crucial issue of the block grant adjustment several months ago, where he has been absolutely a steadfast advocate of what the government has argued for. And it has given the government tremendous capability and strength in our negotiating position to have the informed commentary of Mr Chisholm in this debate, which has enabled us to build a, a unity across a, cro a wide cross-section of opinion within Scotland. And as this will more likely be the last moment I will have to exchange with Mr Chisholm, um, can I thank him for his distinguished contribution to both the House of Commons and the Scottish Parliament and his courtesy and friendship throughout that time. It will not come as a surprise to members to hear that I am going to miss Annabel Goldie for many reasons but not least of which, she is the only individual I think I can conceive of who could ever say to Parliament that the devolved powers originally were a corset on a political journey. I cannot believe, if, uh, the front bench has been challenging me in the course of this debate to get some other underwear reference onto the parliamentary record. And I intend to refuse the temptation to do so as I could not possibly compete with Annabel Goldie. But, Annabel Goldie uh, has been a friend and colleague of mine for many years and has, uh, she and I served on the, uh, the Enterprise Committee in the first parliament uh, along with Mr McNeill uh, and I, I had to try to maintain some degree of order in the process as the convener of the committee. But throughout her years as leader of the Conservative Party, as a committee member and as a wise voice in this process and uh, Barnes Goldie will know uh, the thoughtful and helpful and constructive role she has taken in the fiscal framework negotiations for which I am profoundly grateful in getting us to what I consider to be a good uh, outcome and I wish her well in her future activities in the House of Lords. I reassure her I have absolutely no intention of ever joining her there under any circumstances possible and conceivable uh, but I do wish her well in her, her future political <laughs> activities. Mr McNeill made, uh, as, as always, a, a deep and thoughtful and very personal contribution to this debate and linking his, and I do remember the day he announced the, the, the birth of his granddaughter to Parliament and, uh, and making that comparison between the, the growth of, um, of from, a, from a, 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 a small baby into a young woman of his granddaughter and the growth of this Parliament and the development of this Parliament. And that theme was echoed by Alex Salmond in his speech, about the, where he talked about the, the fledgling parliament into which we were all elected in 1999, which at many occasions felt very, very fragile. And particularly in a media environment, which had warmly welcomed and encouraged the creation of the parliament, and then spent a lot of time trying to dismantle and to damage that parliament. And some of us made our contribution to that agenda by some of the things that we did at that time. Um, but I think it's interesting to observe, as Mr McNeill observed about his, about the, his observation about the, the, the development of the Parliament over the years, and as Alex Salmond did likewise, about the strong and emphatic position the Scottish Parliament now occupies in our national life. Mr McNeill said that his granddaughter and her peers would look to this Parliament for leadership, and that is, I think, a fair comment. That is what has happened to our country. This Parliament has become more central to the lives of all of our citizens within Scotland. And the other common theme of Mr. Salmond and Mr. McNeill's speeches was the, the, the link to the industrial heritage and activity of Scotland. When the Ferguson shipyard went into administration in the summer of 2014, 
I knew very clearly from the direction of my First Minister at that time what I had to do. And I knew from Mr McNeill's presence at the Ferguson shipyard the day I went there. That shipyard had to be restored and resurrected. And what a buoyant future it has now as a consequence of the emphatic leadership given by the former First Minister and the care and attention of the Member of Parliament for Greenock and Inverclyde at that time. And I pay tribute to him for that. Uh, I have, uh, Alex Salmond uh, was both my predecessor and my successor and um, <laughs> in, in, in a very unique set of circumstances and I want to put on record the, my appreciation and admiration for the astonishing contribution Alex Salmond has made to the national life of Scotland and uh, which is not over yet, he's going to carry that on in the House of Commons and representing the people of, uh, of Gordon. But as First Minister of this Parliament, of having the boldness to say to his colleagues in 2006, we're going to go into this election and win it, and it did force some of us to sit up a bit more sharply to, uh, uh, to address that challenge. But throughout his activities, he has given decisive and emphatic leadership to ensure that Scotland became a more confident country as a consequence of his efforts and for that every single one of us should be profoundly grateful to Alex Salmond for the enormous transformation he has delivered in Scottish society. What is less known about the record of Alex Salmond is that for those of us who have been close to him when we have faced political and personal challenges there is nobody more trenchant and supportive and a better ally to have in those difficulties. And I thank him for all of that work that he has done on our behalf. <laughs> Lastly, many members have been very kind about my contribution in this debate, and I thank them for that. Um, I, 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 I'm going to contradict Ian Gray. I have no other flaws, none whatsoever. <laughs> but I do want to close on a point of agreement with Jackie Bailey. I do agree with Jackie Bailey. And I, I, I urge my, co my colleagues to listen very carefully to what I'm going to say. I agree wholeheartedly, unreservedly with Jackie Bailey, that there should be no limit on the ambitions of this parliament. That is, that is, that is, that is beautiful music to my ears. And we are on a journey as a country. We came into this parliament in 1999 and we had a more limited set of powers. And at various different stages along the road, we have acquired more powers and we acquire a, a, a broader and more substantial range of powers today. Not as many as I would like us to have, but they are welcome, they are substantial, they will be used with energy and intelligence and wisdom if this government has the good fortune to be re-elected on the 5th of May. We will devote ourselves to that task and ask Parliament today to endorse the legislative consent motion in my name. Many thanks. Thank you all for taking part in this important debate and that concludes the debate on the Scotland Bill UK legislation and it's now time to move on to the next item of business. And the next item of business is stage three proceedings on the Land Reform Scotland Bill and, and in dealing with the amendments members should have the bill as amended at stage two, the Marshall List, the supplement to the Marshall List and the groupings. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division on the bill this morning. The period of voting for the First Division will be 30 seconds and thereafter I will allow a voting period of one minute for the First Division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the Marshall List to which we now move and I call Group 1 uh, and I call Amendment 12 in the name of the Minister, uh, group with amendments 14, 15, 20, 21, 22 and 29. Minister, if you're ready, would you like to move amendment 12 and speak to all other amendments in the group, please, as soon as you are ready. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, um, Presiding Officer. And while this is um, indeed a historic uh, day, in terms of our proceedings on Scotland's land reform journey, I must also start by giving uh, my apologies that as members I hope will understand and realise that I am uh, struggling today uh, with a bad throat infection. 
So, but I have very kindly, I have the, the support and the help of my colleague, uh, Paul Wheelhouse, uh, who will also be uh, helping to give us support through the amendments. Presenting officer, amendments 12, 20, 22 and 29 are minor amendments which tidy up the drafting of section one of the bill on the land rights and responsibility statement. A number of amendments were made to section one during stage two and further amendments are proposed today which have increased its size considerably, making it unwieldy uh, for the reader. Now, amendment 22 improves this by splitting section one into three sections which cover the duty to create the land rights and responsibility statement, the publication and review process of the statement and the duty to promote the statement respectively. Amendments 12, 20 and 29 are minor consequential amendments which are necessary as a result of Amendment 22. Amendment 21 clarifies the duty on Scottish Ministers regarding what is set out in the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement. The duty as currently drafted requires Ministers to further the objectives in the statement. Now this was a very helpful addition to the Bill that was proposed by uh, Mr Russell at Stage 2 and I said then that I was happy to accept his amendment but would have to consider whether further changes in wording would be needed at stage three. Now the definition of the statement was also amended at stage two from a statement of ministers objectives for land reform to a statement of principles for land rights and responsibilities in Scotland. The purpose of this amendment is to tie in with that revised definition so that ministers are now required when exercising their functions and as far as reasonably practicable to promote the principles set out in the statement. With amendments at 14 and 15, presenting officer, I very much welcome these amendments from Sarah Boyack. The strength and well-being of our communities you know, is right at the heart of all the work which the Scottish Government does and I'm happy to accept uh, Ms Boyack's amendments which ensures this is given due regard in the land rights and responsibilities statement. Many thanks. I now call on Sarah Bayek to speak to Amendment 14 and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, can I note the Minister is not 100% in terms of her health today and inform her that I have actually written out all my speeches in draft for today. So if my voice goes, Claudia Beamish is going to stand in. But I'm hoping we won't get to that point. Uh, what is clearly going to be a marathon session today. Um, I very much welcome the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement. It will help in terms of implementing this uh, legislation. Um, the presiding Officer, Amendments 14 and 15 replace the words fostering community resilience with supporting and facilitating community empowerment in the list of factors that Scottish Ministers must have regard to with the desirability of when preparing the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement. When I proposed adding fostering community resilience at stage two, I did this in part because it would be in line with the spirit of our other recent land reform legislation, the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015. And I was very keen that we establish clear links between the Community Empowerment Act and the Land Reform Bill to ensure that the focus on community empowerment was both maintained and strengthened. Now, the new wording of supporting and facilitating community empowerment is more appropriate as it directly links to the kind of principles the statement will contain. It also links back to the 2015 Act, which seeks to support our communities to empower themselves through the ownership and use of land. And I think it's important that when preparing the statement, ministers are required to have regard to the desirability of supporting and facilitating the empowerment of our communities. And that will ensure that our communities remain at the heart of our land reform agenda. Communities should be supported in taking responsibility for improving their interests and outcomes. And I believe the land rights and responsibility statement could play an important part in supporting their empowerment. So I very much hope that my amendments will be supported today. I'm very glad that the Minister is accepting them and uh, I hope that that might mean that some of my other amendments um, that are coming very shortly, no, well I thought I'd try. Um, I'll at least, at least be glad that these two amendments are likely to get through. Thank you very much. Thanks. Call Alex Ferguson. 
Um, just very briefly, if I may, presiding officer, I just want to commend the uh, minister's determination to be here, despite obviously not being very well. I will let my own colleagues sweat it out as to which one takes over if I'm afflicted by the same problem. Um, but it's nice to be able to start the day on a note of consensus because we are very happy with these, uh, all of these amendments in this group because we believe they improve the land right responsibility statement. Thank you. Many thanks. Minister, to wind up, please. Um, I'm very happy not to wind up, but uh, I'm very happy to welcome the support that we have across the chamber. Excellent, thank you. And so the question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Many thanks. So we'll now move to Group 2. I'm going to call Amendment 13 in the name of the Minister. Group to other amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister, to move Amendment 13 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Presiding officer, at Stage 2, I brought forward amendments that required Ministers in preparing both the Land Rights and Responsibility Statement and the Part 4 guidance to have regard to the desirability of promoting respect for and observance of relevant human rights. Now, at Stage 2, uh, both Mr Russell and Ms Boyack made helpful uh, additions uh, to the Bill by bringing forward amendments that set out that human rights included economic, social and cultural rights in certain instruments, such as the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure of land, fisheries and forests um, and other instruments as Scottish ministers after consulting the Scottish Human Rights Commission considered to be relevant. Now the amendments in this group build on the issues that were raised uh, by both Mr Russell and Ms Boyack at stage two. Amendments 16, 17 and 19 define human rights in section one. Now this definition it expressly includes human rights that are contained in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Amendments 13 and 18, these require the Scottish Ministers in preparing this statement to have regard to the desirability of promoting respect for such internationally accepted principles and standards for responsible practices in relation to land as they consider relevant. And these principles and standards include those principles and standards that are in the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure of land, fisheries and forests in the context of national food security. Human rights, setting officer, is defined by Amendment 19 to mean the convention rights and other human rights contained in any international convention, treaty or instrument ratified by the UK, including the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. In determining what rights are relevant, human rights uh, for the purposes of Section 1, ministers may consult the Scottish Human Rights Commission and such other persons or bodies as they consider appropriate. Now, this reflects a point that was made by Mr Russell at Stage 2 as to the assistance the Scottish Human Rights Commission will be able to provide in considering what are relevant human rights in this context. The definition of human rights is wide enough to include other human rights which we have identified could be relevant, uh, such as um, rights in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, the voluntary guidelines uh, on the responsible uh, governance of tenure of land, fisheries and forests, being a framework document which sets out principles and internationally accepted standards for responsible practices rather than a human rights instrument in the same sense as the International Covenant or the European Convention on Human Rights is dealt with slightly differently. So Amendments 13 and 18 ensure that ministers have regard to the desirability of promoting respect for such internationally accepted principles and standards for responsible practices in relation to land which they consider to be relevant to the preparation of the statement, including the principles and standards in the voluntary guidelines. Now, that wording also leaves ministers open to have regard to other relevant international standards and practices in relation to land, which may come into effect in the future. Amendments 53, 54, 55, 56 and 59 apply the same approach to consideration of human rights and the voluntary guidelines in part four and the preparation of the part four uh, guidance. So these amendments, presenting officer, ensure that we are taking uh, a robust approach to the interpretation and definition of human rights within the bill. 
these amendments they show, they, they demonstrate our absolute commitment to human rights in the context of the land reform debate, which are crucial to achieving our goal of ensuring that land is owned and used in the public interest for the benefit of the people of Scotland. Amendment 93. <coughs> <coughs> Presiding officer, um, Amendment 93 is consequential on Amendments 19 and 59, which define human <coughs> rights for the purposes of Parts 1 and 4. This amendment removes the interpretation provision which sets out rights that are included in the term human rights. These amendments reflect our preferred approach of defining human rights in each part, both for accessibility and because there is not a uniform definition of human rights which can be applied throughout the Bill. I move amendments 13, 16, 17, 18, 19, 53, 54, 55, 56 and 59 and amendment 93, all in the name of Dr MacLeod. Many thanks. I now call on Sarah Boyer. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, well, for us, the strengthening of the human rights underpinning of this legislation is incredibly important because it provides the context for the detail of the legislation which comes thereafter, and it then provides the framework by which people will interpret the implementation of this Act. It's also important in recording the fact that community rights need to sit alongside our rights as individuals. So I very much welcome the amendments we have in front of us today from the Minister. This was a key issue that was raised in the Stage 1 report, which had cross-party buy-in, and I think we all felt needed to be strengthened. Mike Russell at Stage 2 moved an amendment to add specific reference to the International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights, and we very much welcomed and supported that amendment. I had moved an amendment suggesting the addition of a requirement for the Scottish Government to have regard to the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance and the tenure of land, fisheries and forests in the context of national security national food security. By adding these references, we don't just strengthen our own legislation in land reform, we align ourselves in solidarity with other communities and other countries, and particularly those ind indigenous communities across the globe that some of us have met over the years in our cross-party group in international development. So I welcome the fact that the Minister has taken our intentions and improved the wording on our intentions and put them in the correct part of the bill. It's something when you move an amendment, you do your best at the time. So the fact that this has been taken on by the, the Minister, I very much welcome. The references to internationally accepted principles and standards are important to have in the face of this bill. And the amendments from the Minister also include reference to seeking the views of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. I believe this is important to ensure that their expertise on human rights is drawn on. Their letter to the committee was trenchant, and I welcome the fact that the Minister has addressed the concerns that they raised with us just a couple of months ago. This revised legislation will speak to the ambition of delivering global sustainable development and acknowledging the importance of food security and the capacity to support and sustain communities. It makes the connection between our ambitions for global sustainable development goals with our ambitions for land reform and the empowerment of communities across Scotland. Scottish Labour will therefore be supporting these amendments today. And finally, I would like to put on record um, our thanks for the advice and work of Global Witness, um, because they particularly gave us um, good ideas and good advice about how we strengthened the human rights framework on the bill. And I'm glad to see that we now have those amendments in front of us that I hope we can all support. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. Now call on Mike Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am very pleased that the Minister has uh, brought forward these amendments, which build upon the amendments at Stage 2 and the Stage 1 report, which, as Sarah Borak says, was, uh, uh, were supported widely across the Committee. Uh, land reform in Scotland at this particular stage is a hard thing to do. And it is a hard thing to do because of the ECHR. Not that I am in any sense against ECHR, but land reform post-ECHR tends to get focused, as we saw at the start of this debate, on the individual rights of property. There are other rights, and those rights are expressed in a range of documentation, including the documents referred to uh, in these amendments. Uh, and this has been a key issue, because as Sarah Bayak says, it connects us with the issues of land use and access to land that are widespread throughout the world. And the work of Megan McInnes in Global Witness in helping us to understand that, the work of Peter Peacock in Community Land Scotland, helping to uh, bring these issues to focus, and the work of Kirsten Shields in the University of Dundee should be acknowledged. We should also recognise the excellence, world-leading excellence, of our own human rights framework. 
the work of Professor Alan Miller, the retiring um, chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, needs to be recognised as it is recognised internationally. And the addition to these amendments of ensuring that the Scottish Human Rights Commission is consulted on these issues as we go forward with land reform is extremely important. I've said several times during this bill that, ironically, it would not be possible for this chamber presently to pass the Crofting Reform Act of 1886 because it impinges upon uh, ECHR, and particularly A1P1, the Article 1, Protocol 1, about the rights of property. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to undertake radical land reform in Scotland. Of course we should try. Our constituents want it, my constituents want it, and people across the country want it. But it's harder to do. And what we have laid in here, and well, I'm grateful to the Scottish Government for laying it here, and particularly to the Minister who undertook the same steps in the Community Empowerment Bill and agreed to similar changes, what we've laid in here is a foundation for future action in Scotland. Because the foundation, as the law goes forward, will not just consider the important elements in ECHR. We'll also consider other documentation and other experience worldwide. And we'll allow land reform to, to deepen and intensify in Scotland for the benefit of the people of Scotland, because this is not an abstract. This is about how people relate to the land, is how people use the land, is about he, how we, as the many, access the land of Scotland, uh, which is a, a common birthright. So this is a big step forward. It may seem technical, but it's a vital step forward, and I'm grateful to the Scottish Government for helping that step forward to move. Many thanks. Call Alex Ferguson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I have harboured the occasional concerns about this concept of relevant human rights ever since it first appeared in evidence to, in, within the committee, because there seems to be a sort of unmentioned inference within that concept that the government could somehow uh, sort of cherry-pick whatever convention or, con or covenant most suited its purpose and that various other guidelines and conventions are somehow on an equal footing with ECHR. Uh, indeed, um, Dave Thompson apparently believes that we should simply dispense with ECHR when it comes to agricultural holdings legislation, which was an interesting concept in itself. I do sometimes wonder if um, some of these... Oh, of course I will, Mr Thompson. Dave Thompson. I thank the member for taking the intervention. I have no recollection of saying such a thing at all, uh, Mr Ferguson. I may quote from, if I may quote from the official report, Mr Thompson said the fact that ECHR is written into the 1998 Act needs to be looked at. That provision needs to be removed so that we have the same freedom in proposing legislation as any other legislature. And I do, I do wonder if some of these conventions could not actually come back to sort of haunt the government a little bit. Article, Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which the Minister mentioned, commits signatories to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications. And I do find myself wondering where that might leave the government, for example, on its stance on GM crops if it were to be tested. But that is for another debate. What I really would be grateful for, in, if the Minister could address in winding up, if she was able to confirm that ECHR still provides the basis for the human rights and Scottish legislation that is passed by this Parliament. Minister, to wind up. If I may, Presiding Officer, I'll just respond on behalf of Dr McLeod, uh, just to confirm that the ECHR does form the basis of the uh, point that uh, Mr Ferguson raises. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 14 in the name of Sarah Boyack. We're ready to debate with Amendment 12. Sarah Boyack to move. Moved. Thank you very much. So the question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Many thanks. Call Amendment 15 in the name of Sarah Boyack. Sarah Boyack to move or not? Moved. Many thanks. And so the question is Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Many thanks. I now call Amendments 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 and 22, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 16 to 22 on block. Moved on block. Many thanks. Does any member object to a single question being put in Amendment 16 to 22? As no member does, the question is that Amendments 16 to 22 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Many thanks. And we now move to Group 3, and I call Amendment 100 in the name of Johan Lamont, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Johan Lamont, to, to move Amendment 100 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you very uh, much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I move um, uh, Amendment 100 in my name? And in doing so, can I declare an interest as a member of the Cooperative Party? 
committed to a model which represents a global ideal locally, democratically and practically delivered. Cooperatives and, as identified here, community benefit societies have a great deal to offer as we consider the issue of land reform. And I would urge the Minister um, to understand and reflect that this is a, a logical consequence, I think, of their own position around community empowerment. There is no doubt that community benefit societies can have a significant social but critically economic impact and can ensure that in communities where the land is held in common, there is an underpinning democratic commitment which ensures the engagement of those who best understand the needs of their communities and critically the opportunities that can be created to sustain these communities. And any um, consideration of where land reform and, and community ownership has happened, you can see that flourishing of community engagement and cooperative models to ensure um, there is a benefit to the community. Now, this is in fact a very modest amendment, but a, a significant one, I believe, because all it's doing is asking the land, land commissioners, as part of the programme of work, to raise the issue of benefits of community land ownership and how it can be promoted and to look at how the whole question of community benefit societies can also be promoted. And I genuinely believe that um, this is a way and a means of harnessing all the talent and energy we see in our communities where there have been engagement around land reform and it's a, a, a fundamentally important opportunity to ensure that land reform also enriches and sustains those communities. Um, I, I won't comment too much on other amendments at this stage, but I would obviously commend amendments from Claudia Beamish. And can I also thank the Minister um, in relation to Amendment 27 for acknowledging a point I made at stage two, which was to exclude people who work for a local authority from being part of the Land Commission. We'd exclude a whole number of people, but particularly in rural and island communities, those local authorities provide very important employment, sometimes only on a part-time basis. And I would like to thank her for that. And can I say that I do think that reflects the approach of the Minister um, in large parts of this bill, and I commend her for that. And I do hope that people can find it um, worthwhile to support the amendment in my name, Amendment 100. Many thanks. I now call on Jim Hume to speak to Amendment 23 and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Amendments 23 and 24 are in respect of the maximum period of tenure of a Scottish Land Commissioner. At stage two, I lodged a similar amendment, which was withdrawn on the basis of a further clarification coming from the Minister around appointment terms. Uh, unfortunately, the position remains uh, unclear on the face of the bill. The bill, as drafted per Clause 8.3, uh, allows for each member of the Land Commission to be appointed for such period not exceeding five years, and Clause 8.5 allows for reappointment with 8.5a, limiting the reappointment again to a period of not exceeding five years. There's nothing at the moment to stop a Commissioner serving for 10 years or even more than a, a two-year five terms. So in terms of the principle of a, an eight years cap, this would ensure new blood in order to meet uh, challenges of the Commission's strategic plan and programme of work, which itself is subject to review and, review and update and, and prevent any entrenchment or long-term domination of views or approaches by particular individuals. It's also a sufficient period of time so as not to create any difficulties with the smooth operation of the Commission. Uh, the amendments uh, which are in the interest of good government tie in with the Code of Good Practice referred to, referred to by the Minister at Stage 2, which doesn't state how many times a member can be reappointed, but instead caps the total period for which a member can serve at eight years. The Minister said that the Bill would allow for Scottish Ministers to adhere that, as it allows them to determine the length of appointment up to a maximum of five years, but is the period uh, beyond that in terms of reappointments, which is still in question and remains unclear. So my understanding is that, is that not all public bodies come within the Commissioner's remit. They are only recognised as regulated bodies by the Commissioner for ethical standards in public life in Scotland, where specified. And while some bodies may observe the code in practice, the Commissioner, commissioner can have no locust, uh, but actual appointments are dealt with through the public appointments and public bodies, etc., Scotland Act 2003. And perhaps the Minister could clarify whether there needs to be a reference to the 2003 Act in the Bill to ensure that the appointments are in fact so regulated by the Commissioner, because that's not currently referenced in the Bill. Uh, Re-Amendment 101, I think it's important to ensure that our future land commissioners do have the desirable experience and knowledge of what may be in front of them. Someone with practical knowledge of land management can easily be able to judge uh, if land has been actively managed or not derelict or vacant, etc., uh, as farming is still the main use of our land, whether owner-occupied 
or, or tenanted. So my amendment 101 would ensure that uh, agricultural interests are provided with due consideration. Uh, amendment 102 uh, in relation to members of any committee established by the Land Commission will accept that under section 15.4 the Commission may appoint a person who is not a member to be a member of a committee and this makes practical sense. There has, with other recently established bodies, like uh, I think Historic Environment Scotland, for instance, been provision stating that such a person is not entitled to vote at meetings of the committee, unless subsequently the committee, Commission itself decides those non-members attending a committee could have a vote as, as the bill is drafted, and ultimately matters would normally go back to the Commissioners for final decision, and they can make their own rules. So in the interest of consistency with other recently formed bodies by the Scottish Government and for reasons of transparency, I would propose that this provision is uh, inserted, which does not affect in any way the committee's members' right to speak or present a case or otherwise fulfil the role. Thank you. Hey, thanks. I now call on Claudia Beamish to speak to Amendment 25 and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, I rise to speak to Amendment 25 and 26 in the group and to make some other comments as well. Uh, while I listened with care to arguments put forward in the RACI committee discussions that there should not be too many areas of skills and experience listed, um, in those in my amendment are, I believe, of fundamental importance uh, in relation to the Land Commission in the development of a fairer Scotland and thus should be listed. I would at this stage like to thank the Minister for support in developing my stage two amendment and uh, living in hope, this might be the first amendment in this parliament that um, I actually get passed, so we never know, <laughs> never know our luck. Um, so uh, to, to be more serious about this issue, section 9A, section 91A sets out that in appointing members of the commission, the Scottish ministers must have regard uh, to the commission having expertise or experience in certain matters. And Amendment 25 adds human rights, equal opportunities, and the reduction of inequalities of outcome which result from socio-economic disadvantage to the list in this section. Amendment 26 is a consequential amendment to provide that the definition uh, of equal opportunities in Section 9.4 applies to the inclusion of equal opportunities in the Section 9.1a as well as in Section 9.1b. Uh, I, I'm afraid I'm not able to support uh, Jim Hume's Amendment 101 as um, the, the word practical, I think, makes it um, too restrictive and specific, although we understand the, the spirit of um, what Mr Hume is putting forward. And I now also declare an interest as a member of the Scottish Co-op Party and wish to speak strongly in support of Joanne Lamont's uh, Amendment 100, uh, because I, I'm very clear that cooperative models which involve the members, as, as she said so eloquently, actually are one of the ways forward for our rural and indeed urban communities uh, in Scotland in the development of their own aspirations. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Angus MacDonald, who will speak to us initially in Gaelic and repeat his opening remarks thereafter in English. Mr MacDonald. Uh, Martin Va, Offagar Regal, Agus Martin Va, Co Breakin. Um, Hamia Kurloch, Er and Corum, a Horst, and a Harakug, Gaelic, Kohiangel, Chusho, Gan Chumar Dispatch, Gun Jiligi, Re Duel Gadas, von Acharakug, Ere Aga Akum, A Gianov, Kinchuk, Guvel Koyu, Unyech Lavurst, Nagalic, Era Hamishan, Alessa Kai Ferran Ur. Presiding Officer, rather than crucify our Indigenous language any further, uh, I'll continue in English. And for the record, uh, what I was trying to say in Gaelic was uh, I appreciate the opportunity to bring this Gaelic re related amendment to the Chamber, which will deal with a problem which has arisen from my Stage 2 amendment, ensuring that there's at least one Gaelic speaker serving on the new Scottish Land Commission. Um, at stage two, I lodged an amendment inserting a new subsection 1A into section nine, which states that in appointing the land commissioners, the Scottish ministers must take every reasonable step to ensure that one of the commissioners is a speaker of the Gaelic language. The Scottish Government welcomed this amendment at stage two. However, on reviewing its text, the Scottish Government considered 
that it could be interpreted as meaning that Scottish ministers need to take reasonable, reasonable steps to ensure that only one land commissioner is a Gaelic speaker. So this may cause practical issues when making appointments and in a scenario in which more than one Gaelic speaker has applied, this provision could read as meaning that Scottish ministers shouldn't appoint a second Gaelic speaker. So to remedy this, uh, this stage three amendment inserts the words at least into section 91A so that it now reads, in appointing the land commissioners, Scottish ministers must take every reasonable step to ensure that at least one of the commissioners is a speaker of the Gaelic language. So this amendment brings the new Scottish Land Commission in line with precedents already set at the Land Court and at the Crofting Commission. And I'll be happy to move the amendment. Many thanks. And I now invite the Minister to speak to Amendment 27 and other, members, other amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We would like to thank Joanne Lamont for setting out the rationale behind Amendment 100. As Dr MacLeod said to uh, Ms Lamont when she brought forward a similar amendment at Stage 2, the Scottish Government supports all types of land tenure and, of course, supports ownership of land by community benefit societies as well as other land ownership vehicles. We have clearly demonstrated that this is in taking forward the Community Empowerment Scotland Act, which expanded the structures that community bodies can use under the community right to buy to include community benefit societies as well as Scottish charitable and corporated organisations. But we believe that community bodies should have the flexibility to decide for themselves how to constitute themselves, depending on their needs and aspirations. We would therefore be reluctant to support any amendment that could be interpreted as favouring one particular land ownership mechanism over another. We believe it's not appropriate to amend Section 7 of the Bill to, uh, in this uh, way. As far as possible, we want the land commissioners to have operational independence and freedom to determine their own programme of work, and we do not consider it appropriate to constrain them in this manner or to prejudge their work. Uh, we note that the amendment as drafted would mean that the land commissioners would have to include such recommendations in every single programme of work they produce. Um, we do consider that Joanne Lamont's amendment would effectively alter the land commissioners' programme of work in a way that is unnecessary given the excellent work being taken forward by the One Million Acre Strategic Implementation Group. We have recently funded a, a development officer post with Community Land Scotland to enable them to build capacity and to support them in promoting community ownership and sharing best practice. <coughs> um, we thank Jim Hume for explaining uh, the rationale behind uh, amendments 23 and 24. These uh, amendments have similar aims to amendments that were lodged and then withdrawn at stage two. The presiding officer, uh, following stage two, Dr MacLeod wrote to uh, Mr Hume to set out why such amend an amendment is not needed. For the record, we will set this out again to the chamber. And it's uh, our intention that the public appointments process will be regulated by the Commissioner of Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland. The Commissioner publishes a code of practice for ministerial appointments to public bodies in Scotland. And as a matter of policy, the code of practice will mean that no member of the Commission would serve for more than eight years. To ensure that there is the necessary flexibility to deal with exceptional circumstances, however, the provisions of the code can be varied with the agreement of the Commissioner. At stage two, uh, session on 20th of January, the Minister confirmed that it was our policy intention that Parliament should also approve any reappointment of a member of the Commission and was happy to support Alex Ferguson's amendment that clarifies this on the face of the Bill. Uh, therefore, we would also stress that sections 8, 2 and 5A of the Bill mean that the Parliament will be required to scrutinise and approve both appointments and reappointments of members of the Commission. So if Parliament were to have a concern about a particular reappointment, that the balance between continuity and fresh blood on the Commission was not being correctly struck, then it would be able to make that concern heard during the appointment process. Uh, Jim, we also emphasise that uh, in respect of Jim Hume's comments that um, the bill at section 8, subsection 3, uh, provides for a, a maximum period of five years. And um, we have stated our intention that the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland's Code of Practice will apply and it can as a matter of policy. There is also an order making power in section 3, subsection 3 of the Public Appointments and Public Duties <laughs> except for Scotland Act 2003, which could be used to add the Scottish Land Commission to Schedule 2 to that Act. The reason that this was not expressly done in the bill was because of the deliberate policy choice to give a prominent role to the Parliament in the public appointments process. Um, we also thank uh, Jim Hume for explaining his Amendment 101. Uh, the list of experience and expertise referred to in Section 9, Subsection 1A has grown throughout the bill process and we would like to emphasise again to the Chamber that it does not prevent Ministers from considering whether candidates for Land Commission have other relevant experience or expertise. Uh, we understand the sentiment behind the amendment and we can assure Mr Hume that it is our intention in the public appointments process to select the best candidates we can to serve on the Land Commission. However, a balance has to be struck between getting the right people that tick every single box 
and, and getting them appointed with a reasonable timescale to do the work that is required to progress land reform in the future. It was after listening carefully to views of stakeholders that Dr McLeod brought forward an amendment at stage two to add land management to section nine, uh, subsection 1A. We do not think the addition of practical adds anything to that term and so uh, we do not support this amendment. Uh, I think, um, sorry, oh yes indeed. <laughs> we would like to thank uh, Claudia Beamish for lodging amendments 25 and 26 which we are very happy to support. Uh, and I, I take uh, Ms Beamish's point, I'm, I'm glad she's had a, an amendment accepted. Uh, we consider that they supplement the list in section 9, subsection 1A, in a manner that mirrors the package of amendments lodged by the Scottish Government at stages 2 and 3 uh, to strengthen the Bill in respect of human rights, equalities and furthering the reduction of inequalities of outcome which result from socio-economic disadvantage, as Claudia Beamish referred to in her remarks. Presiding officer, uh, given the Scottish Government's commitment to the importance of the Gaelic language and Gaelic culture to Scotland, Dr MacLeod welcomed Angus Macdonald's amendment at stage two and we are very happy to accept what we think is a helpful revision now. Uh, in respect of amendment 27, we would like to thank Joanne Lamont for querying at stage two uh, the inclusion of local authority workers in the list in section 10, subsection one, which sets out persons that may not be appointed as a member of the Land Commission if they have been in certain offices within the last 12 months. Following stage two, Dr MacLeod uh, reflected further on this list and wrote to Ms Lamont to advise her that uh, ministers intended to remove the exclusion in respect of local authority workers since, uh, as she highlighted, in remote and rural communities in Scotland, it can be the case that many people are reliant on local authority employment. We would also like to, to add for the record that the work of the Land Commission will be relevant to urban as well as rural communities, the length and breadth of Scotland, and we would not wish to exclude local authority employees in our urban communities from applying to be a member of the Commission either. Amendment um, 28 is a consequential amendment to ensure that repairing tenancies created under Section 5C of the Agricultural Holdings Scotland Act 2003, as inserted by Section uh, 79B of the Bill at Stage 2, are caught in the definition of relevant tenancy in Section 10, Subsection 3. This will ensure that any tenant or landlord of a repairing tenancy is excluded from being appointed as the Tenant Farming Commissioner, as is already the case for other types of agricultural tenancy. Uh, we thank Jim Hume for setting out the intention behind his amendment 102. Uh, however, we cannot support this amendment. Section uh, 16, subsection 2 of the bill permits the Commission to regulate its own procedure and those of its committees, including the quorum of any meeting. And section 15, uh, subsection 6 requires a committee to comply with any directions given to it by the Commission. These are important provisions as they give the Commission the freedom and flexibility to set up their own internal working procedures, including on issues such as voting rights but they also ensure that the Commission has ultimate control of its committees. Given the operational independence that Scottish Ministers wish the Commission to have, we feel it would not be appropriate to make this amendment in isolation. Uh, we welcome amendments three and four uh, lodged by Mr Day to section 20 of the bill. The Scottish Government considers that it is imperative that land commissioners can give full consideration to the land use strategy in exercising their functions. Uh, however, we are pleased to hear that it is not, Mr, uh, not Graham Day's intention to alter Scottish Minister's duties under the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009, and so we are supportive of these amendments for providing that clarity. I move Amendment 27 and 28 in the name of Dr MacLeod. Many thanks. And I now invite Graham Day to speak to Amendment 3 and the other amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The amendment to Section 25 of the Bill that I brought at Stage 2 was, I thought, quite straightforward, and I was delighted to secure the support of both the Committee and the Government. However, since Stage 2, there has been some traffic from stakeholders around the amendment, suggesting that, as drafted, it could be open to misinterpretation. Therefore, at the request of stakeholders and the Government, I brought forward these amendments to my Stage 2 amendment to provide clarity. It was never the intention of that Stage 2 amendment to give the Land Commissioners any statutory role in the implementation and monitoring of the Land Use Strategy. Amendment 3 deletes the words implementation and monitoring of, leaving the Commissioners to take into account the Land Use Strategy and exercising their functions under Section 20 of the Bill, which is as it was intended. I would request the support of the Chamber in delivering the clarity sought by some stakeholders. Amendment 4 is a minor and technical amendment to ensure that any Land Use Strategy revised under Section 57.6 of the 2009 Climate Change Act, as well as the one prepared under Section Section 57.1 is covered in Section 25D of the Bill. I move the amendments in my name. Many thanks. I have one open debate speaker request, Alex Ferguson. 
Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I'm afraid I we would oppose Amendment 100 because I believe that the proposals within it are already being taken forward. I think the, uh, the Minister mentioned the One Million Acres Working Group that I, I do believe encompasses a lot of um, Joanne Lamont's intentions. I also am under, understand that the Land Commission will cover the provision of advice and guidance. The Minister made it very clear at Stage 2 that the government encourages a wide variety of land ownership models, and uh, I take her at their word for that, and Amendment 100 therefore seems to me to be overly prescriptive. We will support all the other amendments in the group, and I'm sorry to hear that the government will not support group, uh, Amendment 102, because I, I think that is, in the interest of good governance, quite an important amendment. Um, but just generally, on, on the subject of the Land Commission, I do believe that the success or otherwise of the Land Commission will be very largely dependent on the ability and the experience of the commissioners themselves who serve on it. And I hope sincerely that the range of skills that we have sought as a committee through amendments at stage two and as a parliament at stage three will only enhance its operations uh, for the benefit of the people of Scotland. Many thanks. I now invite Joanne Lamont to wind up and indicate if you intend to press or withdraw, please. Okay, thank you very much, um, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I say on, on the, the amendments from Claudia Beamish and from um, Angus MacDonald, I think these are important amendments to support. As someone with a Gaelic heritage herself, I recognise the importance um, and I recognise the struggle in actually speaking the language of our forebears. But um, I think it reflects a deeper issue, which is the danger that people appointing people to boards appoint themselves. They appoint new people who look and sound like themselves. And I think these um, amendments create the opportunity to actually think more seriously about how you ensure there's a range of talents and commitments um, going into this, this public body. And so we'd want to support these. On the question of one amendment, I will be pressing the amendment because I actually do believe that community land ownership is one of the most effective um, models of, of, of land ownership. It does ensure, and the record is there in terms of our own history, to see the way in which common ownership of, of land has ensured that communities which may have been struggling have been revived and regenerated. And what the amendment asks is to address the potential of community ownership and the potential of community benefit societies to benefit um, local communities. And therefore, in those regard, I don't regard it as over-prescriptive, but reflecting the reality that too often the cooperative model is not included whether it's in the strategy of the Scottish Government or whether in the past, when we've talked about economic models, we have not looked to the cooperative model, we have not understood its power and the power that it has. And the reality is, particularly not um, in our island and rural communities, there's a natural instinctive means by which people have cooperated cooperate, whether it was crofting uh, committees or whatever people have come together, whether it's community shops or community enterprises. And this simply locates in this bill the significance of that model in terms of ensuring why we're engaging with the whole question of land reform is to address the question of neglect, is to address the question that too often too much of our land has been left unworked, unused and communities um, unregenerated. And I think it's in that context that I would hope people feel able to support the amendment, which I will be intending to press. Many thanks. And before we turn to that, can I ask the Chamber that if any member wishes to oppose any amendments today, that they do that loudly and clearly, please, so that there is no confusion in the Chamber. The question is that Amendment 100 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed since this is the first division of the morning. The Parliament is now suspended for five minutes.
we proceed with the division on Amendment 100. This is a 30-second division. Members should please cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 100 is yes 33, no 83, there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 23 in the name of Jim Hume, which has already been debated with amendment 100, and I ask Jim Hume to move or not move. Uh, not moved. Thank you. I now call amendment 24 in the name of Jim Hume, already debated with amendment 100, and I ask Jim Hume to move or not move. Not moved. Call Amendment 101 in the name of Jim Hume, already debated with Amendment 100, and ask Jim Hume to move or not move. Moved. Question then is that Amendment 101 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. This is a 30 second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 101 is yes 21, no 94. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 25 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with amendment 100, and I ask Claudia Beamish to move or not move. Move, presiding officer. Thank you. The question is that amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Call Amendment 2 in the name of Angus Macdonald, already debated with Amendment 100, and to ask Angus Macdonald to move or not move. It moves, President Officer. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 26 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 100, and I ask Claudia Beamish to move or not move. Move, Presiding Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 27 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 100, and I invite the Minister to move formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 28 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 100, and I ask the Minister to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 102 in the name of Jim Hume, already debated with Amendment 100, and I ask Jim Hume to move or not move. Formally moved. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 102 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There is a division. This is a 30-second division. Please vote. The result of the vote on amendment number 102 is yes 23, no 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 29 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with amendment 12 and I invite the Minister to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. 
I call Amendment 3 in the name of Graham Day, already debated with Amendment 100, and I ask Graham Day to move or not to move. I move, presiding officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are. I call Amendment 4 in the name of Graham Day, which has already been debated with Amendment 100, and I invite Graham Day to move or not move. Move, presiding officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are. In which case, we move to Group 4, and I call Amendment 30 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already group, uh, sorry, grouped with Amendments 5, 6, 31, 32 and 33. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 30 and speak to all of the amendments in the group, please. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, some stakeholders and members of the Rural Affairs and Climate Change Committee have expressed strong concerns about the conduct of some land agents. So amendments 30 and 32 respond to those concerns. They require the Tenant Farming Commissioner to prepare a report on the operation of agents of landlords and tenants in relation to agricultural holdings. And that report must include the Commissioner's recommendations for improving the operation of land agents in the sector. It may also include other recommendations which the Commissioner considers appropriate. The Commissioner must consult relevant stakeholders when preparing the report and submit the report to Scottish Ministers within 12 months. If I can now come to Mike Russell's amendments 5 and 6, which would ensure that stakeholders are invited to give their input to the review of the Commissioner's functions under section 22 of the Bill and that Ministers must take their views into account. Uh, as I made clear at stage 2, the Scottish Government does believe a wide range of stakeholders should have the opportunity to feed into that review, so we are very happy to support these particular amendments. In terms of amendments 31 and 33, they are technical amendments. 31 specifies that before the Tenant Farming Commissioner publishes a code of practice under section 25, they must consult any persons appearing to the, commi the Commissioner to have an interest in the draft code. This is just a clarification that it is in the eyes of the Commissioner that such persons have an interest in the draft code. In the same way, in terms of Amendment 33, that clarifies that before submitting the report to Scottish Ministers under Section 33A, setting out recommendations for a modern list of improvements to agricultural holdings, the Commissioner must consult any persons appearing to the Commissioner to have an interest in the draft recommendations. So I move Amendment 30. Many thanks. Can I now invite Michael Russell to speak to Amendment 5 and other amendments in the group, please? Thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the key features in this bill is um, the possibility that change in practice can take place by encouragement or whether, as I believe, there is a necessity for statutory force. Uh, that is true in this section, and it is also true in Section 4 of the Bill that deals with engagement uh, of estates with communities. In this particular section, I, I, I know that the Cabinet Secretary is very keen to see the work of the Tenant Farmer and Commissioner being one of encouragement and bringing forward good practice so that uh, those who are not observing good practice can be uh, encouraged to do so. I think many of us uh, fear that the, uh, there are some people who will not be encouraged. Uh, good landlords will continue to be good landlords. Those who want to be good landlords may find the publication of the uh, information in the codes to be useful. Those who begin to realize they aren't good landlords might improve their practice. But those who don't want to be good landlords, those who frankly don't care about being good landlords, uh, will not uh, feel any force so to, to change their uh, practices and their habits. This is uh, a carrot in this bill. I do believe, as others believe, they should also be a stick. But nonetheless, I do accept the Cabinet Secretary uh, does believe that this is the way to go forward. But when this is reviewed in three years' time, the, the views of everybody in the sector need to be heard. And that is particularly true of hearing the views of tenant farmers themselves. And the Scottish uh, Tenant Farmers Association and others will have to be part of that review. So I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for accepting the amendments that involves the widest group of relevant stakeholders in that review. If at the time of the review it is obvious that the role of the Tenant Farming Commissioner in encouraging better practice has been on the whole substantially successful, then there is no harm in having a wider uh, consultation. If it has not been successful, it is essential that there is a wider consultation. So I will be moving these amendments. Many thanks. I have three bids to speak. Could I ask members to keep the remarks short, please? Claudia Beamish to be followed by Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour is supportive of Scottish Government amendments on land agents in view of the concerns that the Rural Affairs Committee heard about the behaviour of a small minority of land agents. We also support the amendments by Michael Russell 
on consultation with a wide range of stakeholders in relation to the review. And I'm clear that the role of the Tenant Farm Commissioner will bring confidence to tenants and landowners and through the development of the functions will be able to, uh, to better the relations of that small minority of cases where there are poor relations and hopefully keep uh, issues out of the land court. Thus, I welcome further clarif clarification in this section on the functions and the role of the Tenant Farmer Commissioner will also enable the new developments in such things as rent reviews and much more to, to be carefully monitored and developed. So we support all the amendments in this group. Thank Many you. thanks. Graham Day to be followed by Rob Gibson. Uh, thank you. Uh, some months ago, a land agent asked me why members of the Iraqi committee were pursuing the introduction of a code of conduct which would cover himself and his colleagues. He told me he did not recognise the claims made about the conduct of some in the sector. I shared with him the experience of a tenant farmer constituent of mine who just had a representative of a leading land agency visit his home to tell him that he would have to be a 50% rental increase non-negotiable. He responded by naming two firms of land agents that he thought the person concerned might have worked for. I told him that they worked, in fact, for another company and, more importantly, drew his attention to the fact his response kind of proved the point that while those providing agent services might deny there was an issue, deep down they know full well there is. Let's be clear, the majority of agents will conduct themselves in a respectful and appropriate manner conducive to fostering and maintaining good landlord-tenant relationships. But if there is one thing which unites the agricultural sector, it's a belief that we need a code of conduct. So I welcome the government's amendments and I hope that the proposals which come forward will reflect the lived experience of tenants and landlords and get us to a place where fear of the reputational damage that would be caused those employing people providing land agent services who misbehave, that it would in itself ensure the code of conduct is adhered to. I hope Parliament will also support amendments five and six in the name of my colleague Michael Russell. Many thanks. Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Um, the negative influence of uh, land agents is far wider than the few exceptions that were mentioned by Claudia Beamish. And uh, I think that a statutory code of practice for land, land agents would be a very good thing indeed. Uh, it would be uh, probably the kind of thing that answers the concerns of many people around the country for evidence we took ourselves in the island of Isla, where a tenant farmer told us that he had to raise three incomes, one for his family, two for the land agent, and three for the landlord. In those circumstances, the question about the way in which land agents work is something which interferes with the potential profitability of many uh, tenant farmers' activities, and that, as a whole, that their influence is one which needs statutory control and as soon as possible, and I am very happy to support these three amendments. Many thanks. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to wind up, please? Uh, just very briefly to reflect on some of the contributions, I did explain to the committee at stage two why I do not believe at this stage it is appropriate for the Tenant Farming Commissioner, which is after all a new office being established by this bill, to have a broad enforcement role given the conflict with other enforcement agencies that could uh, lead to. But certainly I very much appreciated that many members and indeed many stakeholders felt that there may well be cases where additional powers will be required by the Tenant Farming Commission in terms of its functions, and that is why this review is necessary. And in terms of the land agents, again, as many members have highlighted, we may be talking about a small minority of land agents that contribute towards poor relations in the sector, but these issues do have to be dealt with, and that is why it is important that the Tenant Farming Commissioner is able to bring forward recommendations in due course. Many thanks. The question is that Amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 5 in the name of Michael Russell, already debated with Amendment 30, and ask Michael Russell to move or not move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 6 in the name of Michael Russell, already debated with Amendment 30, and ask Michael Russell to move or not move. Moved, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. I call Amendments 31, 32 and 33, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 31 to 33 on block, please. Moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 31 to 33? Since no member objects, the question is that amendments 31 to 33 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. That then brings us to group five.
and I call Amendment 34 in the name of the Minister, which is grouped with the other amendments as shown in the groupings. And I invite the Minister to move Amendment 34 and speak to all of the amendments in the group, please. Presiding officer, these amendments implement the commitment I gave at stage two to amend the bill to include a power for Scottish ministers to make regulations that will provide for the disclosure of information about persons who have a controlling interest in landowners and tenants, and for this information to be published on a public register kept by the Keeper of the Registers of Scotland. <coughs> Increasing the transparency of land ownership in Scotland officer, is a key objective for this bill. And during the passage of the bill, it was clear that Parliament and stakeholders felt that we could do more to deliver in this area. So what I am bringing forward today is an amendment to introduce a regulation-making power that will enable the government to develop proposals to address the many practical and legal issues that arise in this policy area. <coughs> amendment 34 puts in place a power that will enable the Scottish ministers to make regulations requiring the disclosure of information about persons who have a controlling interest in landowners and tenants and for the publication of that information in a public register to be kept by the keeper. To ensure that the policy objective of increasing the transparency of land ownership in Scotland can be achieved, the definition of persons who have a controlling interest in a landowner or tenant will be one of the key provisions set out in the regulations. Now, it is clear that we will need to consult widely about this definition and the potential to use definitions used in existing legislation. Most notably, definitions um, officer, most notably definitions used in legislation for the register of people with significant control of UK companies. Um, another key area we will have to develop and consult on is in relation to which landowners will be required to provide information. The Scottish Government intends uh, that the information will have, be, uh, will have to be provided where the landowner is a legal entity such as a company or a Scottish limited partnership or an individual is the owner of the land but holds a title to the land under a special capacity such as a trustee. One of the advantages of the Government amendment over Section 35A that was inserted into the Bill at Stage 2 is that the regulations can require the disclosure of information about persons who have a controlling interest in landowners or tenants in respect of all legal titles in Scotland. Section 35A only requires disclosure of information in relation to land registered in the Land uh, Register, which accounts for only 28% of the land mass of Scotland. The Government is determined that the Parliament has a full opportunity to scrutinise the regulations effectively. Therefore, Amendments 35, 36 and 37 provide that the regulations will be subject to an enhanced form of parliamentary procedure on the first use of the power. Amendment 34 provides that the regulations will be subject to the affirmative <coughs> procedure, but on the first use of the power, uh, Amendment 35 provides that the Scottish Ministers cannot lay the draft list regula first regulations unless they have complied with the consultation requirements laid out in Amendment 36 and the proposed draft regulations and an explanatory document have been laid before the Parliament. Amendment 36 provides that the proposed draft regulations must be laid in the Scottish Parliament for 60 days and be accompanied by a draft explanatory document. Scottish Ministers must consult the Keeper and such other people they consider appropriate and they must be provided with a copy of the proposed draft regulations and the draft explanatory document. This means Parliament will have the opportunity to scrutinise and make recommendations on the proposed draft regulations. In addition, the public will also be able to make representations to the Scottish Ministers on the proposed draft regulations. Only after this consultation has been carried out uh, can the draft first regulations be laid before Parliament. When the first draft regulations are laid, they will be subject to the normal affirmative procedure, giving Parliament a further opportunity to scrutinise and take evidence from Ministers. Amendment 38 removes Section 35A from the Bill. The Government believes that bringing forward these regulations is the best way to ensure the transparency of land ownership that we all want to see. Uh, we must also put on record that Section 35A, as it stands, is out with the legislative competence of this Parliament and must be removed to ensure that the Bill can proceed to royal assent. Amendment 94 provides that all uses of the regulation-making power in Amendment 34 <coughs> will be subject to the affirmative procedure. Amendment 95 provides that Section 101 of the Bill is amended to refer to Amendment 34 and so exempt for the Crown from being uh, criminally liable in respect of breaches of the requirements of the regulations made under Amendment 34. This is simply a consequential change. The Scottish Government believes that these amendments provide the best way forward to deliver the transparency of land ownership in Scotland and we recommend them to this Parliament. 
Uh, we would urge the Parliament to support these amendments and I, I move Amendment 34 in the name of Dr McLeod. We would like to thank Sarah Boyack for lo lodging her amendments and we acknowledge the work that has gone into drafting them. <coughs> Firstly, we would like to reiterate the Scottish Government is committed to increasing the transparency of land ownership in Scotland and the Government will bring forward regulations that will provide for the disclosure of information about persons having a controlling interest in land. The Scottish Government will publish a consultation this summer on developing proposals for the regulations. The responses will be uh, helpful to inform the drafting of the proposed regulations, which will need to be laid before Parliament as required by the enhanced affirmative procedure to be set out in the face of the Bill by Amendments 35, 36 and 37. Alongside the Parliament, uh, parliamentary and public consideration of the regulations and the practical issues highlighted in a letter from Dr McLeod to the Rural Affairs Committee on the 3rd of March. The Government will be working on the practical arrangements to give effect to the regulations. Our intention is that the regulations will be approved by Parliament by the end of 2017. Uh, I will now turn to addressing Sarah Boyack's amendments. Um, amendment 34A seeks to provide that Ministers must make regulations under Government Amendment 34. The Bill currently provides that Ministers may make such regulations and this is the normal formulation for affirmative regulations. The Scottish Government is clearly on the record as saying we will make regulations, but in these exceptional circumstances and in such a clear level of support for our proposals, we are willing to support this amendment. Amendment 35A uh, requires the Scottish Ministers to lay a draft of the first regulations to be made under Amendment 34, subsection 1, within 18 months of the Bill receiving royal assent. Having a duty such as Amendment 35A could mean that to comply with the duty, Ministers would have to bring forward regulations that did not provide for the full policy. A further set of draft regulations would then be brought forward at a later date containing the remaining policy detail. It would only be after these second uh, regulations were made that the full scheme could come into force. Alternatively, if a draft of the first regulations is not laid before the Parliament within the 18-month time limit, the amendment could have the effect of not allowing a draft to be brought forward at all at that time. This could prevent the Government from making regulations. The Government will bring forward draft regulations for approval by this Parliament and therefore these amendments are not required. Uh, we would ask Sarah Boyack not to move this amendment given the commitments we have made on timing. Amendment 34B, 34C, 34D and 34G seek to replace the term controlling interest with significant control. We do not think this change is necessary. What is meant by a person having a controlling interest in landowners or tenants will be set out in the regulations under Amendment 34. The definition will be designed to enable the policy objective of increasing the transparency of land ownership in Scotland to be achieved. The definition will not be constrained by the use of the term controlling interest in other legislation. We would ask that Sarah Boyack does not move these amendments. Amendment 34E provides that the matters the, the regulations can provide for may include duties associated with the provision of information. The regulation, uh, regulation making power in subsection uh, 1A refers to regulations requiring the provision of information and subsection 2D already refers to information that must be provided under the regulations. Therefore, this amendment is not required. Uh, we would ask that Sarah Boyack does not move the amendment. Amendments 34F and 34H attempt to limit the circumstances where a person can request that information about them is not published. Subsection 2H provides that regulations may set out circumstances when information does not have to be published. Subsection 2H provides that the circumstances when a person may request that information not be published uh, may, be, uh, may in particular include where publication may result in serious risk of violence or abuse or threat of violence or abuse or intimidation to a person. Subsection 2H does not require that regulation provide uh, in the, that in this circumstance when a person could request that information not be published. Careful consideration will have to be given to determine if the regulations should provide for such circumstances and we would ask that Sarah Boyack does not move this amendment. Amendment 34I seeks to provide that regulations under subsection 1 may provide that the information about controlling interests be available on the internet and searchable by the public. The regulation making power in subsection 1 expressly provides power to make regulation about the publication of information in a public register. The regulation making power is wide enough to allow regulations to be made about access to the public register. The Scottish Government are committed to providing digital public services. We do not consider that these amendments are necessary to provide for online access and we would ask that Sarah Boyack does not move this amendment. Amendment 34J provides that regulations made under subsection 1 cannot be used to amend the regulation making power in subsection 1. It would be very difficult to use the regulation making power in Amendment 34 to amend itself as the regulations would have to be within the scope of that power. We do not want there to be any uncertainty as to the validity of the regulations and so do not intend to make regulations amending the regulation making power. 
This amendment is not appropriate and is unnecessary, and we would again ask that Sarah Boyack does not move her amendment. Amendment 37A appears to be designed to clarify that the Scottish Minister can include summaries of responses to the consultation in the explanatory document that has to be laid before Parliament under Amendment 35. There is no limit on the Scottish Ministers using the information provided in representations in developing the regulations and reporting in general terms on the representations made, even were this restricted uh, under the terms of sec subsections 2 and 3 of Amendment 37. As a result, we do not consider that Amendment 37A is required, and we would again ask Sarah Boyack to not move her amendment. Turning now to amendments uh, by Mr Harvey, amendments 103 and 104 by Patrick Harvey are the same amendments he brought forward at Stage 2. Uh, they aim to provide that only legal entities incorporated in the EU could, uh, could be uh, registered as the proprietor of land in the Re Land Register of Scotland. These amendments were debated and voted on at Stage 2 and rejected by the Rural Affairs Committee. <coughs> amendments 105 and 106 seek to prevent the registration of title to land in the Land Register by entities incorporated within the British Overseas Territories as defined in the British Nationality Act 1981 or the Crown Dependencies, Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man. Amendment 106 sets out that the entities incorporated or established within the British Overseas Territories or the Crown Dependencies that already have a title registered in the Land Register must take steps, such, such, such steps as are necessary to ensure that they are no longer the registered proprietor five years after the date that Amendment 106 comes into force. Amendments 105 and 106 have the same effect as Amendments 103 and 104, but the entities affected are very different. At Stage 2, the Minister for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform said that the amendments lodged by Patrick Harvey in relation to EU entities would not achieve the transparency of land ownership that is wanted, and also stated that these amendments were out with the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament. For the same reasons given at Stage 2, we consider that amendments 103 and 104 would be out with the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament as they are incompatible with the rules on the free movement of capital in Article 63 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Turning to Amendments 105 and 106, they have a similar effect to Amendments 103 and 104, but in relation to, these, uh, to different types of legal entities. The difference between uh, being these amendments restrict the legal entities incorporated or otherwise established in British Overseas Territories and Crown Dependencies from registering title to land in the Land Register. These amendments appear to be targeting the British Overseas Territories and Crown Dependencies, as some of these territories and dependencies are referred to as secrecy jurisdictions. As I hope we have uh, clearly set out today, the Scottish Government is committed to increasing the transparency of land ownership in Scotland. It is clear there is support across the Parliament for doing this. But in legislating in this area, we have to ensure that measures we put in place deliver the transparency we all want to see and do that in a way that is within the legislative competence of this Parliament. We understand that the purpose of these amendments is to increase the transparency of land ownership in Scotland, but we are not convinced that these would provide the transparency that is desired. What would prevent a proprietor from reincorporating in a country that is equally as uh, untransparent as some of the jurisdictions that are British overseas territories or Crown dependencies? It has not been demonstrated that all the countries affected by this provision are secrecy jurisdictions. It has also been demonstrated that all landowners and tenants registers in those countries are not transparent about their ownership structures. In addition to the Minister's concerns about the effectiveness of these amendments, uh, we do consider that amendments 105 and 106 are out with the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, as I have said, the amendments would not necessarily result in the transparency of land ownership being increased, as it would not necessarily result in land being owned by a legal entity registered in a country that requires greater transparency. In addition, the amendments would not prevent legal entities registered in the British Overseas Territories or Crown Dependencies from being subsidiaries of legal entities registered in other countries. We are committed uh, to bringing forward the regulations that provide for a public register of controlling interests in the next parliamentary session. There are many legal and practical issues that, we ha that have to be addressed in bringing forward proposals that will be effective and proportionate. One of those being uh, how we ensure that legal entities who own land and who are incorporated in secrecy jurisdictions comply with the requirement to provide uh, information. Uh, we would encourage everyone in this Parliament to work with the Government when we are developing the regulations to ensure that we can achieve the transparency of land ownership that we all want to see. We would ask that Patrick Harvey does not press his amendments 103, 104, 105 and 106. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. And I now invite Sarah Boyack to move Amendment 34A and speak to all of the amendments in the group, please. 
Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Well, this group goes to the heart of the ambitions we have for this legislation. And in our committee report for the Stage 1 uh, consideration of the Bill, there was cross-party support for a stronger framework of transparency. That's why we supported the removal of the original wording of the Bill and supported both Graeme Day's amendment and proposed our own amendments to strengthen the nature and availability of registration information on who owns and controls land. The Minister's amendment today removed those amendments and insert a much stronger set of proposals and we support them as far as they go. But I am determined that there are no loopholes or ways round the intentions that we have for transparency. Now, I want to make the point on the record that this has been very challenging to scrutinise the Minister's amendments. Um, we, they were laid last Wednesday, late last Wednesday, and we had less than 24 hours to scrutinise those amendments and then decide what amendments we, we might want to submit. So, the purpose of my amendments are to strengthen the Minister's new proposals and to remove any doubts about what the government say is their good intentions here. Now, there have been observers around this debate who won't understand why the Scottish Government is removing such a substantive matter put into the Bill at Stage 2 to create a register of persons with significant control over land, the, the secret persons who currently can hide their identity in favour of a promise of something better in the future. And some have already suggested that this is to kick the matter into the long grass. And I want to make it clear I'm not attributing that motive to the Minister. And in supporting my amendments, she could put her intentions beyond doubt. My amendments would require that the Scottish Government must bring forward the regulation, not just leave matters that they may bring forward that legislation, and also to specify a timetable within which they will be brought forward. To oppose my amendments would be to raise the very doubts the Minister has been seeking to dispel about the Government's intentions. Now, Presiding Officer, in Amendment 34A, which I move, it is not as if I'm proposing something without precedent. This government's record is littered with examples of when they have used exactly the wording I've proposed today, and the most recent examples being the Carers Scotland Act 2016 and the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2016, sorry, 2015, acts approved by this parliament just a few months ago, and there are many other examples. Now, members will note that one of the bills mentioned is also one taken through Parliament by the Minister with a colleague, the Community Empowerment Act. Of course, all Ministers share collective responsibility for what the Scottish Government bring forward, whether they hold particular responsibility or not. If it is good enough to use this term must in those and other bills and now acts, and to bind Ministers to particular timescales, why should it not be good enough here? Now, I hope that the Minister was not going to give us a dancing on the head of a pin to say, in this circumstance, my amendments aren't appropriate, while well, in every other case they might be. That just doesn't wash. I really hope that the Minister will, can, will reflect and regard these amendments as genuinely helpful towards delivering an outcome we share with the government. Now, there are a couple of my amendments were, in effect, probing amendments, because we weren't able to ask those questions at stage two. But amendments 34B, C and D, I believe, are crucial. Because instead of merely setting a requirement to include provisions about those with a controlling interest, the bill would require those with significant control in relation to land to be registered. Now, in speaking to my amendment, this issue was not addressed effectively. A key definition in Scots law of controlling interest, for example, is a single person with more than 50% shareholding of a company. But it's not just through ownership that people can determine the use of our land. The term persons with significant control is used in UK law and can refer to a broader range of ways in which control is exerted. Shares, voting rights, informal right to exert control, trustees, etc. And already applies to Scotland through the Small Business and Enterprise Act and would be a much better, much stronger definition to include in this bill. Section 34E, I listened to with interest about the Minister, and I will consider um, what further comments uh, the Minister might want to make in summing up. But Amendment 34F seeks to make sure that any exceptions to declaring the identity of someone in the register shall only be in exceptional and limited circumstances. This is incredibly important to minimise any loopholes. Amendment 35, as it stands, 
35, 34 h as it stands, implies that there might be quite wide exceptions, and I was very keen to tease out from the Minister exactly how those exemptions might be put into practice. Um, I accept this might be something we could come to in detailed amendments when we reach those regulations, but I wanted to get a response from Ministers on the record today. Um, and particularly wanted to clarify that the risk of domestic violence is an example of exceptional cases. Um, Amendment 34i would explicitly recognise that the new register may be in an electronic form and capable of being searched online, something that's already possible for the crofting register heard by the Keeper and sets a good example of what we would like to see. The Minister said, and I quote, that, it would be, that the existing provisions in the Bill would now be wide enough to allow access, but I would just like this to be firmer on the face of the Bill. Amendment J, um, the intention here was to prevent amendment of those regulations which would affect their essential purpose. So it really was just to try and get the ministers to be more firm on the record here that this is not something they would seek to do through regulations to water down the initial purpose. Um, in relation to Amendment 35 from the Minister, I welcome this amendment, but I've proposed an amendment to set a timescale for the government and ministers to follow. And I've, I've suggested 18 months from the granting of royal assent, which I think is a reasonable uh, amendment and would allow ample time for consultation to, to take place. It's important that we don't lose the momentum built up. And is the minister really telling us that they will not be ready within 18 months? We've had the land reform uh, review group's work. We've had extensive re uh, consultation on this. We've had hundreds of representation to this bill. And are ministers seriously telling us they're not going to be ready within 18 months to get this through Parliament? My Amendment 37A seeks to tease out what the ministers intend by Amendment 37, because I have to say it's not totally clear. And in the 24 hours we had to put this amendment, we, were, we thought it was unusual wording and actually looked like a way of enabling those who make representations against the register remaining secret, which seems utterly, um, utterly the wrong way to go about things. And it seeks, seems to imply that the Scottish Government would make a disclosure to a committee of Parliament, but they wouldn't make themselves um, that information available publicly. So we really want to seek clarity in this and find out exactly what ministers are intending. It's primarily a probing amendment, so I would like a little bit more in summing up by the minister. Um, if it is something that we return to in the future, then fair enough, but the amendment as drafted wasn't helpful in terms of its clarity. Now, finally, I want to make brief comment about the proposed amendments by Patrick Harvey. At stage two, we supported the suggestion that there should be a requirement for those seeking ownership of land in Scotland to be registered EU entities. Now, this doesn't prevent somebody who doesn't live in the EU from owning land, but it does set expectations of tax transparency. Now, ministers were at great pains to tell us at stage two that this would not be legally possible or competent. And again, this was repeated by the ministers. But I have to say, there have been several examples in relation to ECHR issues, which we have discussed on several points during the passage of this bill, where there have been examples in relation to ECHR issues, where ministers have on reflection changed their views after extensive consultation with stakeholders, with representations from MSPs throughout this bill. So we're disappointed that ministers haven't wanted to seek a way forward to deliver the ambitions in these amendments. And we can think of many examples in this parliament since its inception where political will and creative thinking delivered where at first or even second glance there were barriers, but determination found ways to overcome obstacles. And because we will come back to the issue of tax transparency, we think it's the right thing to do it speaks to the wider concerns that there are in our public of fairness and transparency. And we believe they are in the public interest. So we think they should be um, supported today. And if they're not supported by the SNP government, I am absolutely convinced we will come back to them in the future. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I now invite Patrick Harvey to speak to Amendment 103 and other amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presi uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. During uh, this debate on this group of amendments, both the Ministers and uh, Sarah Boyack have used the word transparency on a repeated basis. And at the stage two discussion, it seemed as though that was a point of agreement across the political spectrum that what we're trying to achieve is transparency, fundamentally. There are many ways of achieving that. One part of this bill is setting a date for the completion 
of the land register. That is a step in the direction of transparency, something I proposed early on in this session in the land registration bill. Better late than never, we are now putting it into law in the closing weeks of this session, and I welcome the fact that we're doing it. Addressing the questions of beneficial ownership is also something that I proposed in the beginning stages of this session in the land registration bill, and I'm glad that we're doing something in this direction uh, in the closing weeks, better late than never. And I very much uh, welcome the work that Graham Day has done at stage two and during the, the stage one discussion in uh, bringing forward proposals in that direction. I actually think that his formulation has an advantage over the, 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 the government formulation in relation to beneficial ownership, specifically because it's about using the land register uh, rather than another register. But if the government's amendment is going to be passed to, uh, to change that approach, then I think it should be passed with Sarah Boyack's amendments to that approach. If I heard it right, uh, I think the government said that they did intend to support 34A, uh, and I welcome that. There are other amendments from Sarah Boyack which I think also add value uh, to the approach that the government is taking. But very consistent, very consistent with these other approaches, completing the land register and making steps in terms of beneficial ownership, is a need to recognise that getting our own house in order is not enough because there are others using mechanisms such as uh, offshore uh, territories to avoid the level of transparency that we're setting into our own law. And so at stage two, I did offer the option uh, of an EU proprietorship condition uh, with a, a five-year period for retrospective application. And I bring that back to the chamber for discussion, along with an un another alternative, uh, one based uh, on British overseas territories and Crown dependencies. I reject the argument that this is a barrier to the free movement of capital. Even those for whom the ideological attachment to free movement of capital is more important than our agreement on the objective of transparency, I just reject the argument that it is a barrier to free movement of capital. It's entirely reasonable for an organisation to set up an entity which is registered uh, within the EU or preferably here in Scotland if they wish to own and sell land. And in fact, representatives of the uh, landowners uh, who responded to the consultation said that they do not see a re re an EU proprietorship requirement as a serious barrier to an organisation that has a committed interest in owning land in Scotland for legitimate purposes. We know that these loopholes are being exploited. We all know it. Just this week, my own colleague Andy Whiteman, uh, working with Common Space and the National, has exposed the activities of the Buclew estate with its uh, incorporated vehicle in uh, the Cayman Islands, avoiding the level of transparency that we should hold landowners in Scotland to. This is simply not acceptable, and I, I welcome the, the fact that the Labour Party is supporting it. I think there are many in the SNP as well who want this done. This is not a new idea. It was strongly supported in the consultation on this legislation. It was strongly supported by the Land Reform Review Group, uh, and it's something which we simply should press ahead with. I will be moving uh, these amendments when the time comes, and I hope that very many SNP members recognise the strong feeling of expectation from their own party colleagues around the country who want these kind of loopholes closed down and want landowners held to the highest standards of transparency. Thank you. Many thanks. I have four members bidding to speak. I don't wish to curtail debate, but I would ask members to be as brief as possible. Graham Day to be followed by Alec Ferguson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As we've heard, the government amendments before us will replace those which I made to the Bill at Stage 2. I accepted then that my amendments might be flawed, and I recognise the concerns raised around those amendments being out with the competence of the Parliament. No responsible parliamentarian should be tied to provisions or amendments which, if featuring in the finished Bill, could lead to being subject to challenge. Just as importantly, the government amendments are, as Sarah Boyack said, a stronger set of proposals. These amendments provide a framework for delivering competent and appropriate transparency, and they should be viewed alongside the letter sent to the Raki Committee by the Minister some weeks ago. No one could seriously claim they represent an attempt to kick this issue into the long grass. That said, I welcome Sarah Boyack's Amendment 34A, replacing the word may with the word must. I think that strengthens the messaging around delivery of transparency. Amendments 103 and 104 would not, as far as I can see, deliver the kind of transparency we would all want and could quite easily be circumvented. 
and legal opinion from a number of sources that I am aware of, uncontested legal opinion it seems, suggests they fall out with the legislative competence of the Parliament. Can I conclude, President Officer, by making one point, and that is that we have come a very long way on the road towards delivering transparency. And can I give due credit to the Minister for the leadership she has provided in that regard? Thank you. Alec Ferguson, to be followed by Michael Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I will be brief. Um, Scottish Conservatives have no difficulties whatsoever with bringing greater, uh, uh, a greater degree of openness and transparency to land ownership, and we never have had. But I am really concerned, as other members have mentioned, at the lack of time we've had to really digest and look at the full implications of this whole group of amendments. Um, it, it, it is something that, that really does bother me because there is a feeling created by that lack of time that we are somehow creating legislation on the hoof here. Uh, I have to say at least the Scottish Government's amendments appear to be within the scope of our competence, unlike uh, Patrick Harvey's, I think. But I, I do think the important thing is to make sure that what, what we put in place is workable and doable and it makes sense and people understand it and it delivers a tangible benefits in terms of ownership transparency. For that reason, uh, we will be supporting uh, amendments 34 and 34A um, I, and for that particular reason, I'm not, uh, we will not be supporting 35A because the important thing is to get this right. Thank you, President Officer. Many thanks. I call Michael Russell to be followed by Nigel Dorn. The presiding officer, Patrick Harvey, said that he thought that some backbench MSPs supported the concept of transparency. All backbench MSPs I've spoken to support that, transport, that transparency yeah. completely. <laughs> the, question is, the question is not whether you support transparency, the question is how you achieve transparency. And you achieve transparency by backing the amendments from the Minister. Graham Day played a, a, a wonderful role in bringing this and focus, no, let me, I would like to finish, Mr Harvey. You, Graham Day played a very important role in focusing this debate at stage two. The Minister came forward with practical solutions and we need practical solutions. And if you put into this bill any solution that isn't legislative competent, you wreck the entire bill. I am 100%, 100% committed to transparency. I want that register up and running as soon as possible, as everybody else who has spoken does want that register up as soon as possible. But in order to make the progress we have to make, we have to do it in a way that is more clever than just running at it and assuming that wishes will produce good legislation. It is work that produces good legislation. Thank you. I now call Nigel Dawn, and I have a bid by Rob Gibson, who will follow Nigel Dawn. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I rise, of course, as the convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, just to pick up on one issue here. We do very much welcome amendments 34, 35, 36 and 37. And <clears throat> we also uh, recognise that they bring forward an enhanced form of uh, uh, procedure uh, for the first introduction of these regulations, which was what the committee was extremely concerned to achieve. We do, however, note that despite what the Minister has already said, the regulations remain as wide for any second and subsequent opportunity when they might be used, but the, affirm the enhanced affirmative procedure will not be required. Now, can I say, Presiding Officer, that it makes perfectly good sense if the grand sweep of these is achieved at the first time and subsequent amendments are technical issues at the edges. However, there is a procedural point here which the committee is concerned about, that if they are completely rewritten, and I don't think this government is proposing to do so, but if they were to be completely rewritten, then the procedure would simply be the affirmative procedure. And that, in the eyes of my committee, is not the right way to proceed, and it wouldn't be in any other circumstance. So the committee would be very grateful if the minister would be able to confirm uh, on the record that there is no intention of using the wide scope of these for any subsequent uh, amendments and that they will be simply tidying up as well inevitably required. And I think the committee would be grateful if that could be put on the record, please. Thank you. Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. I'm sure that SNP members across the country who have been following this debate will support our government's competent and sensible and legally competent means to take this forward. And it's very concerning to me that the lengthy debates and discussions during uh, the time of this bill's passage, which have involved the members of my committee with government, government officials uh, and various other parties, uh, should uh, be put aside in order that a proposal brought in at the end, which does not meet 
uh, the legal competence, but which actually uh, asks this Parliament, without any sight of legal advice as to uh, amendments 103 to 106 is uh, competence should pass. Why can we not have these debates in the fashion which uh, the Parliament uh, normally does, that is, during the length and the time in which we are talking? You know, I think it's very important. I think, excuse me, I'm just not finished yet. I think it's very important. That order, please, order. I think it's very important that we are able to hold people who have land to account. That is the practical aim. And eventually, I hope, when the land register is uh, map-based, to be able to tax them. These are the aims. Transparency is a word which encapsulates those things, but it's holding landholders to account that's at the heart of this, and the government's proposals do just that. Thank you. I now call on the Minister to wind up on Amendment 34, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, firstly, can I say, as Mr Harvey correctly picked up, that um, we did indeed indicate that we were going to support uh, Amendment 34A in the name of Sarah Boyack earlier. And just for, in case it was missed, uh, Presiding Officer, I'll just repeat that section just so that, the, that Sarah Boyack has the opportunity to hear it. Um, Amendment 34A seeks to provide that Ministers must make regulations under Government Amendment 34. The Bill currently provides that Ministers may make such regulations, and this is the normal formulation for affirmative regulations. The Scottish Government is clearly on the record as saying we will make regulations but in these exceptional circumstances and with such a clear level of support for our proposals we are willing to support this amendment so just to put that on record um, I also want to say in relation to um, taking wide regulation making powers which will be able to pick any of the amendments suggested by Sarah Boyack if they are supported in consultation and we are uh, in terms of you know keen to make sure that um, we do all practical steps to, to take careful consideration of those. It's worth pointing out in terms of the timing, which I know is a point Sarah Boyack raised in, the, in her remarks of 18 months and why we were uh, being careful about the timing. Uh, we obviously have uh, extensive consultation that will be required around the regulations themselves and also a desire to, to ensure that we respect <coughs> the Parliament's right to set the timing of, of such sessions. Uh, I will, with permission of the President. Officer, Rody Grant, please. briefly, please. Rosie Grant, please. Uh, just very briefly, um, the Minister will recognise there is concerns because this is issue has been before the Parliament before and it was voted down by the Government. People have waited a long time for this, so reassurances that it will happen now would be really important. Minister? Absolutely, and, and the Government is keen to give assurances, uh, assurances that this, this work will take place. We're just being careful about the timing. We Look, there's much of it which is out with our control. It's in the hands of uh, parliamentary committees. We don't want to prejudge the timing of the committee's work and indeed the uh, outcome of the consultation, but the government is sincere <laughs> in taking forward uh, this work, and that's why we've agreed to Amendment 34A to put must into the face of the bill to, to demonstrate our commitment to doing so. So I hope that uh, members on the Labour benches take, take comfort from that, uh, that point. Uh, Registers of Scotland, other point just to make in relation to, to, the, to this section of amendments is Registers of Scotland are taking plans forward for Scotless, Scotland's land information system. This is a comprehensive information system about any piece of land or property in Scotland. So uh, government and the uh, Register of Scotland is, is taking forward significant steps to improve the transparency and availability of data about land ownership. Michael Russell made excellent points in regard to the competence of any bill. Uh, I think he made those points very powerfully. I don't need to repeat them, but uh, the government can, uh, certainly can, uh, agrees with them on the points he made about ensuring that, that all legislation that passes through this place is, is competent and, uh, and takes account of ECHR. Uh, Nigel Dawn, uh, on behalf of the uh, Delegated Powers Committee, makes reasonable points uh, in relation to the use of the powers, and we have, just to confirm, as requested by Mr Dawn, we have no intention to rewrite the provisions and, and to ensure that uh, we remain within the spirit of the, uh, and the letter of the provisions in terms of super affirmative procedure. Um, in regards to uh, the wording of Amendment 34, subsection 2H, we would, uh, this would cover an exemption for publication where this would result in a person being at risk of domestic abuse, to reassure Ms Boyack on, on that point. And the wording of Amendment 37 is based on existing legislation in the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010, agreed and passed by this Parliament. Uh, so uh, there's no variation from that wording. 
Uh, in regards to Mr Day's amendments, as he quite correctly said, uh, we were concerned about the amendments that were brought forward not being potentially within ledgers of competence of the Parliament, and there were a number of reasons for that. Uh, the amendment, as drafted, did not provide appropriate protections for individuals' rights to privacy under Article 8, uh, and, for example, the amendment does not require a proprietor or the keeper to remove a person's name from the title sheet when that person has ceased to be a person of significant control. I, I'm sure Mr Day is aware of further detail um, that we, we don't need to, to go through just now. As regards to Mr Harvey's point um, and his reference to Mr Whiteman's uh, uh, blog, recent blog in the article in the, in the National, uh, the, the company's structures lie behind the ownership of the Buclew Estates Limited. It's not appropriate for the government to comment on the individual circumstances of landowners and the tax affairs of individuals. However, um, the government believes that Mr Harvey's proposals would not work. There's nothing in his proposals which prevents a company owning land in Scotland from being wholly owned by another company registered in a British overseas territory or anywhere else in the world that may be termed a tax haven or a secrecy jurisdiction. Uh, all these amendments would serve to do would be to put another company in the company chain in effect adding to the complexity of the ownership chain. Uh, we'd also like to stress that there are other, many, uh, other, uh, other countries which uh, can be just as secretive, if not more so, than those that are subject to Mr Harvey's amendments. <coughs> I, I will briefly... Preside. Briefly, please, Claudia uh, Beamish. Yeah, I, I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. And would the Minister agree with me that, um, uh, and confirm that the Land Reform Review Group recommendation was that EU ownership should be something that, that was looked at with great care? And it is very disappointing that... Um, the risk-averse Scottish Government has uh, appeared to actually um, to, to not push this as far on, as they please? might do. And I believe that both are complementary. It's not about capital, it's about transparency of ownership. Minister. Um, I think uh, in respect to, to Ms Beamish, we have made very clear throughout the process of the debate today that we very much believe in transparency of land ownership in Scotland and are doing everything we can to do so. But as Mr Russell rightly said, and indeed I reiterate, we have to ensure that legislation that comes to this Parliament is legally competent and that is, is able to be sustained uh, through the courts if need be, if it is challenged. So I would just put that to, to Ms Beamish that the, the measures that she rightly says were in the Land Reform Review Group report, I remember reading them myself, uh, they, are, they are not ones which we can support on the basis of our own understanding of legal competence in this case. Uh, but we do need a solution to deliver the transparency of land ownership that applies to all landowners, regardless of where they are incorporated. And the ability of this Parliament to legislate in certain matters is limited. It's not within the competence of this Parliament to legislate on matters which are reserved. This includes matters of company law or measures aimed to reduce avoidance of non-devolved taxes, such as inheritance tax and corporation tax. And in making legislation, we have to take into account our obligations under European law. And as we have already said, the Scottish Government considers that the amendments brought forward by Mr Harvey are out with the legislative competence of this Parliament. Above all, it's crucial that we bring forward measures to increase the transparency of land ownership, which are proportionate, effective and within the legislative competence of this Parliament. Uh, what this Parliament can do and will do is legislate about land ownership in Scotland. As Alex Cobham, Director of Research with the Tax Justice Network, said in the National, the Scottish Government can take its own steps to ensure that no land is owned without public record of the ultimate beneficial ownership, regardless of which jurisdiction or structure is used. Uh, that said, the regulation-making power of, uh, that we propose today will allow us to do exactly that. It will allow us to make regulations which require the disclosure of information about persons who have a controlling interest in landowners and tenants and for the keeper to publish that information in a public register. These regulations can apply to all landowners in Scotland, regardless of where, where they are incorporated. If I could just uh, go a bit further, I'll bring in Mr Harvey in a minute. Unlike Mr Harvey's amendments, which only seek to limit ownership to persons registered in certain jurisdictions, restrictions that would be easily circumvented in our view. The Scottish Government is committed to make land ownership in Scotland transparent and we hope that everyone here today in the Parliament is supportive and will work with the Minister, the Scottish Government and the people of Scotland to help us achieve the goal of greater transparency of land ownership in Scotland, which we all want to see. If with consent, I will bring in Mr Harvey. Briefly, Ms Patrick Harvey, please. I am grateful. The, the Minister seems very satisfied that the bill as it stands achieves the level of transparency that he is aiming for. Can he assure us that a, 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 an entity registered in one of these secrecy jurisdictions, such as Pentland Limited, will be held to the high standard of transparency that we're not capable of achieving today? Minister. Uh, th these are clearly matters that M Mr Harvey will, will understand. We're seeing we, we potentially have a lot of scrutiny on the, the uh, procedure to develop the regulations, and that is why we are keen to, to have the time and not setting a time limit. We're going to work with the parliamentary process to ensure that Parliament has the opportunity to scrutinise the regulations that come forward, make sure they are robust enough to deliver the kind of transparency we want. But we, I re return to the point, 
whatever we do as a parliament it has to be legally competent and it has to be within the competence of this parliament. We cannot bring forward measures in the bill that would allow the bill to be shot down by those who oppose it. Thank you, Minister. I now call Sarah Boyack to briefly wind up on Amendment 34A and, intent, and, and uh, indicate if you intend to press a veto. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Well, I very much welcome the Minister's acceptance of the intent behind uh, my Amendment 34A and its details, so I, I will certainly be moving that amendment. With brief reference to the other amendments in my name and the amendments in this group, Mike Russell said it's work that will produce good legislation. Well, I think we could all agree with that. That is our point in setting a timetable for the next Scottish Government. It is crucial that the process is actually planned and worked towards and is done effectively. And frankly, the Scottish Government set the timetable with this bill. We need a better timetable for the next bill. We need a commitment. And it would be the Parliament setting the timetable, not the Government. That is the point. That would be the point of our amendment today. Nobody has effectively and adequately addressed my concerns in Amendments 34 B, C and D um, or F, so I will be pushing them. A couple of the other amendments, Presiding Officer, I will not push. My final point, the Minister asked why we could not have debated the issue of tax transparency earlier. The point is it was debated earlier. It was debated in our Stage 1 report that Ministers did not reply to till after we'd had that Stage 1 debate. So this has been out there for months, for years. The Land Reform Review Group made the point, our Stage 1 report made, our Stage 1 report made these points. It is not a new issue. And the point I would finish with is, where is the Scottish Government's alternative? Today is disappointing in terms of that response, and it's a missed opportunity. It will be unfinished business. The next Parliament will have to come back to. Thank you. The member has pressed. The question is that Amendment 34A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I now call Amendment 34B in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with Amendment 34. And I invite Sarah Boyack to move or not to move. Moved. The member has moved. The question is that Amendment 34B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. This is a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 34B is yes 38, no 76. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment 34C in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with amendment 34, and I ask Sarah Boyack to move or not to move. Moved. The member has moved. The question is that amendment 34C be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a 30 second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 34C is yes 38, no 76, there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And I now call amendment 34D in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with amendment 34, and I ask Sarah Boyack to move or not to move. Moved. 
Member has moved. Question is, is Amendment 34D be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 34D is yes 38, no 74, there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 34E in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with amendment 34, and to ask Sarah Boyack to move or not move. Moved. The member has moved. Question is, that amendment 34E be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a 30 second division. Please vote now. And amendment number 34E is yes 38, no 75. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment 34F in the name of Sarah Boyack. Already debated with amendment 34 and to ask Sarah Boyack to move or not move. Moved. The member has moved. Question is, is amendment 34F be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not. There will be a 30 second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 34F is yes 38, no 75. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment 34G in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with amendment 34, and I ask Sarah Boyack to move or not to move. Moved. Question is, that amendment 34G be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a 30 second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 34G is yes 38, no 74. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 34H in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with amendment 34, and ask Sarah Boyack to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. In which case I call amendment 34I in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with amendment 34, and ask Sarah Boyack to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. I now call Amendment 34 Jai in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with Amendment 34, and ask Sarah Boyack to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. Can I ask the Minister to confirm if pressing Amendment 34? Uh, fully moved. Thank you. Sorry. Question is then that Amendment 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 35 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 34, and ask the Minister to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 35A in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with Amendment 34, and ask Sarah Boyack to move or not move. Moved. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 35A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a 30 second division. Please vote now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 35A is yes, 37, no, 75. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The question is that amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call amendment 36 in the name of the Minister already debated with amendment 34 and to ask the Minister to move formally, please. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 37 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 34, and ask the Minister to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 37A in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with Amendment 34, and ask Sarah Boyack to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. In which case the question is that Amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 38 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 34, and ask the Minister to move formally, please. Formally moved. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I now call Amendment 103 in the name of Patrick Harvey, which has already been debated with Amendment 34, and to ask Patrick Harvey to move or not move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 103 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 103 is yes, 33, no, 81. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 104 in the name of Patrick Harvey, already debated with amendment 34, and to ask Patrick Harvey to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. I now call amendment 105 in the name of Patrick Harvey, already debated with amendment 34. Patrick Harvey to move or not move. Moved. Question is that Amendment 105 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a 30 second division. Please vote now. Amendment number 105 is yes, 33, no, 80. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 106 in the name of Patrick Harvey, already debated with Amendment 34. And I ask Patrick Harvey to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. That then brings us to Group 6, and I call Amendment 39 in the name of the Minister, Group with Amendments 40 to 52, and I ask the Minister to move Amendment 39. Sorry. Sorry, could I, at this stage, could I ask any members who wish to contribute to this part of the proceedings to press the request to speak buttons now, please? And I ask the Minister to move Amendment 39 and speak to the amendments in the group. Uh, Presiding Officer, these amendments are aimed at increasing the availability of information about land ownership in Scotland. In the report, the Land Reform Review Group stated that a lack of consistently accurate information about patterns of land ownership was an issue which hindered them in carrying out their review. To gain an understanding of how land ownership affects patterns of land use in Scotland and the effect of government policies connected to land, it is important to have further information on land ownership. For example, to understand the effectiveness of Scottish government policy on community ownership, it is essential that accurate information about the amount of land owned by community groups is available. The registers of Scotland are often asked to provide information about how much land is owned by a certain category of owner. This information cannot always be retrieved as it is not captured as part of the land registration process. When the bill was introduced, Section 36 provided a power for regulations to be made, enabling the keeper to request information relating to proprietors, including information relating to the category of the owner or tenant, and information relating to individuals having a controlling interest in owners or tenants. 
In their report on the bill at stage one, the Raki committee recommended that section 36 should be amended so that the keeper could require this information and not just request it. Uh, amendments 39 to 49 amend the regulation making power inserted into section 48A of the Land Registration etc. Scotland Act 2012 so that regulations can be made enabling the keeper to request and require information about the category of person or body that certain owners or tenants of land fall into. We have already discussed the amendments the Government has brought forward regarding information about controlling interest in owners and tenants of land. As a result of these amendments, it is no longer necessary for the regulation making power in an in inserted section 48A1 uh, uh, to be wide enough to allow regulations to be made requesting information about individuals having controlling interest in proprietors. Amendments 40 and 46 reflect this. It is un uh, intended that the regulations under section 48A will enable the keeper to require the provision of information about categories of owner or tenant as part of the land register application form. And we consider that providing this information should be relatively straightforward. We anticipate that the land register application form will provide a list of potential categories and the applicant would be required to select any which are relevant to the owner or tenant. The bill already provides that regulations made under inserted section 48A subsection 1 will be subject to the affirmative <coughs> procedure. Amendment 52 provides that the Crown cannot be criminally liable for any breaches of requirements imposed by regulations made under section 48A subsection 1. In looking at this policy, the Government came to the view that in order to increase the number of owners or tenants about whom this information was provided, it was important that the Keeper was given additional powers to add information about the category of the owner or tenant to the land register on her own initiative in certain circumstances. Therefore, Amendment 50 inserts Section 48B into the 2012 Act. This contains a power allowing the Scottish Ministers to make regulations enabling the Keeper to enter information in the Land Register about the category of certain landowners and tenants on her own initiative in certain circumstances. It is intended that the Keeper will only be able to add information about the category of the owner or tenant where this information is already apparent from the Land Register. For example, if one of the categories of landowner is a Scottish local authority, then it should be evident from the name of the proprietor entered in the title sheet whether the proprietor is or not, is not a Scottish local authority. Uh, it is not intended that adding this information to the land register should have an effect on a person's legal title. Amendment 51 provides that regulations made under inserted section 48B subsection 1 will be subject to the affirmative procedure. The Government intends to consult before making regulations under inserted sections 48A and 48B. I would urge the Parliament to support these amendments and I move Amendment 39. In Thank you. Doctor. Two contributions of a few seconds each, please. Claudia Beamish to be followed by Alec Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I wish to speak in support of the Minister's amendments. This will help to clarify the, uh, the position on this important part of the Bill on availability of information on land ownership. And it's very important that the possibility of information on community land ownership is, is a category uh, going forward for land reform. And the additional powers for the Keeper on her own initiative are also important on, on those amendments which the Minister referred to on behalf of um, the other Minister. Thank you very much. <laughs> Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I have little to add, but, and I don't, we don't intend to oppose these amendments. But I do want to repeat and place on record my continuing concerns with regards to significant provisions being introduced to legislation by way of regulation with limited scrutiny. It's not the right way to go about making robust legislation, and I hope this doesn't end up open to challenge. I know the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have concerns as well. Many thanks. Minister, do you feel the need to wind up? I'm happy to leave the right. Many thanks. The question then is, Amendment 39 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendments 40 to 56, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated, and I invite the Minister to move amendments 40 to 56 on block, please. Uh, moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 40 to 56? Since no member objects, uh, the question is that amendments 40 to 56 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Before I suspend Parliament at this stage, can I advise members that when we reconvene in the afternoon for the second part of the legislation, there will be a five minute suspension for the first division of the afternoon. I now suspend Parliament until 2 o'clock.